Recording in progress. Hello. 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 Hello.
प्राइजेस मैंने ऑन कर लिया हाँ ऑन हो गया और ठीक है रिकॉर्डिंग भी अभी ऑन कर ही देता हूँ ना हाँ ऑन कर दे रहा हूँ ऑन कर दिया ठीक है ठीक है ठीक है थीक है हाँ सिद्धार्थ यार आज तुम्हारा वाला है ना है क्या कहा मैंने कहा एक बजे तुम्हारा लेक्चर है आज बस तुम आई ओ टी वगैरह जो भी है उसमें कर देना है हाँ न्यूरल नेटवर्क पे है ठीक है एक बजे में कनेक्ट करूंगा ठीक है यार तुम्हारा ब्रीफ रिज्यूम क्या है ब्रीफ रिज्यूम
सर अभी भी अनम्यूट कर पा रहा हूं मैं अपने आप को नजीर सब चेक करना सर अभी भी कर पा रहा हूं मैं अपने आप को अनम्यूट इसमें मैं करता रहा हूं इसमें म्यूट ऑल ये जो नीचे म्यूट ऑल लिखा हुआ आता है हां वो कर, उसी में क्लिक कर रहा हूं मैं अलाउ पार्टिसिपेंट अलाउ पार्टिसिपेंट टू म्यूट एंड म्यूट देमसेल्स वाले को अनचेक करते रहना हां यस आप देखना अब हो गया ना ठीक है ठीक है मैं बस अब वो जितेन पांडे सर का है भी तो मैं हाँ मैं सर में घर पर हूँ तो मैं मोबाइल से कनेक्ट हूँ तो जितेन पांडे सर को होश बना दूंगा है ना हाँ 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 ठीक है ठीक है
हाँ हाँ राजेश अभी इस साथ जुड़ने वाले हैं है? अच्छा मैं स्टार्ट कर गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग जितेंद्र सर नमस्कार सर सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग हाँ बिल्कुल सर सर आपको कोहोस बना दिया है सर नाउ यू आर को नमस्कार नमस्कार सर सर यू नाउ यू आर होस्ट ऑफ दिस मीटिंग ओके सो यू कैन डायरेक्टली कंट्रोल ऑल द थिंग्स okay so uh, uh, good morning to all and uh, uh, good morning sir so uh, this is fourth day of this fdp on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for societal development so the expert of uh, this meeting uh, this uh, for this fourth day uh, first session meeting uh, is professor uh, dr jitend pande uh, dr Jitendra Pandey is working as an associate professor in the School of Computer Science and IT at Uttarakhand Open University, Hanwani. He has completed BE, M.Tech, and PhD in Computer Science. He has published more than twelve research paper in international journal, twelve research paper in conference proceeding, and uh, he has published three referred books. His current area of interest is cyber security, computer forensic. component based software development education technology and open educational resources as well as intelligent systems he has carried out many research projects under commonwealth education media center simca for asia user and government of uttarakhand presently he is working 
on an international project funded by Commonwealth of Learning Canada. Dr. Pandey has been reviewer of several journals of international repute. He is member of several academic and professional body, bodies in the area of computer science and distance education. He is awarded gold medal from IGNO for innovation in open and distance learning ODL system 2018 by Honorable Vice President of India, Sri Venkaya Nadi. He got the Fellowship of Asian Association of Open University, University Staff Exchange Fellowship 2018 from Sukhothi Open University Thailand and Open University of Sri Lanka in 2019. I welcome very energetic and young and dynamic and my senior professor, Dr. Jitin Pandey, sir. Sir, please over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ashutosh. A very good morning to all the participants. I hope you all are safe and healthy at your home and at your workplace. Before starting today's discussion, let me reiterate what Dr. Sony, Director AICT, shared with us in the inaugural session of this FDP program. He informed us that for new colleges, AICT is only giving approval for the courses in the field of AI, machine learning, data science, etc., with the vision to promote these subjects. These fields are comparatively new and evolving. So a big question is, from where to get the faculty who can teach these courses and from where to find appropriate teaching and learning material, which gives the teachers the flexibility to retain, revise, remix, reuse, and redistribute with others. Dr. Sony already addressed the first part of the question. We will retain the faculty, uh, retrain the faculty members by conducting FDP programs in the above field. Today's session addresses the second part of the question. <clears throat> Where to find appropriate teaching and learning material, which gives teachers the flexibility to retrain, retain, revise, remix, reuse, and re redistribute educational contents with learners. So in today's session, I'll be talking about open educational resources. It is not confined to AI, machine learning, data science, but it is applicable to every field of education. So permit me to start my presentation. It will take some time to uh, load my PPT. So I'm sharing my screen. I hope my screen is visible to you all. Is it visible? Just give me a thumbs up. Is the screen visible to all of you? So before starting this lecture, let me share some of the facts about higher education in, in India. 
And these facts are based on this report. As per AISHE 1819 data, the country had 903 universities, 39,050 colleges, and 10,011 other standalone training institutions. And these institutions cater to over 34 million learners. <clears throat> As per the data provided in that report, learners in general education use about 17 to 27% of their personal expenditures on textbooks, while learners in professional education spend about 9 to 11% of their spending. Rural learners spend more on textbooks than urban learners. 54.6% of male learners and 64.2% of female learners discontinue their studies due to financial constraints. On an average, learners in general education spend over 2 billion rupees annually to purchase textbooks, which is a large sum of money. With the increase in the access of internet, the availability of educational resources also increased. And with the emergence of open courseware uh, movement that is known as OCW, OCM, UNESCO coined the term open educational resources in 2002 at a forum on the impact of open courseware for higher education in developing countries. OER were originally conceived to support education, but now they are also seen as an alternative to traditional textbooks in some countries. So what is an OER? Open educational resources are any type of educational material that are in public domain or are introduced with an open license. So this is the definition of OER. There are several definitions of OER given by various organizations. Uh, as I've already uh, said that, uh, shared that UNESCO coined the term open educational resources, but they have also revised this definition in 2019. The revised def definition is, OERs are teaching, learning, and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access, use, adaptation, and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions. Likewise, William and Flora Havlett uh, Foundation have given the definition. They have actually adopted the definition of creative common, which says that OER is teaching, learning, and research material that are either in public domain or licensed in a manner that provides everyone with free and perpetual permission to engage in the five-hour five -hour activities that, that are retaining, remixing, revising, reusing, and redistributing the educational resources. Similarly, OECD, that is Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, have defined OER as digitized material offered freely and openly for educators, students, and self-learners to 
use and reuse for teaching, learning, and research. OER includes learning contents, software tools to develop, use, distribute contents, and implementation resources such as open licenses. OER, according to the Cape Town Open Education Declaration, uh, declaration open educational resources should be freely, these are the recommendations of the Cape Town Open Education Declaration. Open educational resources should be freely shared through open licenses, which facilitates use, revision, translation, improvement, and sharing by anyone. Resources should be published in formats that facilitates both use and editing, and that accommodate a diversity of technical platforms. Whenever possible, they should also be available in formats that are accessible to people with disabilities and people who do not yet have access to internet. OER, according to Wiki Educator OER Handbook, the term open educational resources or OER refers to the educational resources like lesson plans, quizzes, syllabi, instruction modules, simulation, etc., that are freely available for use, reuse, adaptation, and sharing. And the definition of OER given by OER Common. Open educational resources are teaching and learning material that you may freely use and reuse without charging. OER often have a Creative Common or GNU license that state specifically how the material may be used, reused, adapted, and shared. Anyone can legally and freely copy use, adapt, and reshare open educational resources. So OER recognized the importance of flexibility, reuse, and sharing the resource created. This approach has been summarized by David Willey in his five arts framework of reuse, remix, retain, revise, and redistribute. This framework emphasized the point that all OER users are able to carry out any of these activities with the content. Material can be retained and reused if the contents of the resources is no longer current. It can be revised by the user. They can combine and remix the part of the OER with their existing material. And whether they do or do not make changes to the material, they are also able to redistribute or share the content. Any subsequent user are also able to adapt, combine, and share the material, and so on. The OER is based on the culture of sharing and learning, encouraging the user and the teachers to adopt existing OER, adapt and share with others to maintain the cycle of collaboration and continuous improvement. So what benefit does OER bring? For students, they are cost-effective means for obtaining information about a particular area of study. Resources provided to students can be customized to best suit their learning needs, making the material relevant and engaging. In some cases, there may be an option for the students to contribute to the development or improvement of OER and contribute to the ongoing cycle of OER development and improvement. For educators, it is an option for saving time by making 
and building an existing educational material. In many cases, the academicians are able to pick and choose segments of particular resource and create their own OER. OERs can provide the opportunity to collaborate with other academicians of the world and increase the chance of communication and collaboration. So these are the benefits. OER takes variety of forms, which includes videos, text, diagram, simulations, etc. There is also variety of textbooks available online, which can be used as a core or a supplementary text. Now I will present the journey of OER. I do not claim this list to be comprehensive, but I just want to show how OER movement evolved and became popular. The OER journey started with the University of Tübingen in Germany, which published a video series of its lectures online in 1999. It was followed by MIT's Open Courseware Initiative, which was launched in 2002 with 32 initial courses. OCW was the most in-depth and complete collection of its kind. In 2003, China introduced China Open Resources for Education, popularly known as CORE. It was founded in collaboration with MIT's OCW with an aim to provide access to the high quality educational contents to the Chinese universities and students. Inspired by the OCW, an MIT graduate, Salman Khan, launched Khan Academy in 2006, which provides free access to 10 plus two level educational resources. The Open University of UK also launched Open Learn in 2006, which is an open learning platform of OU and contains self instruction material and other educational resources through its website, Learning Space. Apple also joined the OER movement in 2007 and unveils iTunes U service which is an open and free education platform constructed on the basis of iTunes, which provides brand new development conditions and ideas for co-construction and sharing of OERs. It contains educational audio, video, and PDF content for college and 10 plus two students. The year 2007 also saw another development on OER the successful launch of Describe, an OER initiative of University of Michigan Medical School, which provides all preclinical curricula material as OER. YouTube also launched a free educational channel, YouTube EDU in 2009, which consists of thousands of educational videos, including those from partners like Khan Academy, Stanford, and TEDx. In 2011, Code Academy, an online interactive platform that offers free coding classes in nine different programming languages, was launched to provide free OERs for learning computer programming. TED, which stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design, which is a non-profit media organization, launched TED Ed in 2012 to provide free access to 
top quality educational videos from the world's top teachers to the masses. In 2013, Stanford University launched Stanford Open EDX to offer free online courses that draw more than 350,000 enrollments around the world. So this is how OER journey started and the journey still continues. In India also, several projects to create learning resources have been initiated with the support of government of India. NPTEL has emerged as a flagship initiative for engineering and basic science courses. The resources are released under open license. In Flipnet, host EPG Patshala covering about 12,000 modules in 77 PG subjects. Sharing and reuse is the strength of OERs and is made possible by the permission applied by the original developer on the work that is known as licensing. So before discussing the licensing and the copyright issues, let us see how OERs can be incorporated into teach. There are several ways. We can incorporate learning activities into class materials. We can use or reuse digital assets in learning materials. We can adopt an open textbook in course reading. We can adopt modules and course structure and we can also involve students to develop an OER textbook. So there are several ways how we can incorporate OERs into teaching. So how to identify OERs? One of the easiest way to tell whether an educational resource is an OER is to look at its license. All OERs should be clearly marked in public domain or released under an open license. If this is not the case, the resource is not an OER. The most common way the OER material are released is under Creative Commons license. There are six standard Creative Commons licenses, which are combination of four conditions. So before discussing these Creative Commons uh, licenses, let us see what is a copyright. Copyright is an exclusive right given by the law to the original creator or the author to get credit, to copy, to distribute, to license, to make or sell or make economic translations and to perform. Now, what is a fair use? Fair use is a part of US copyright law that permits use of copyrighted material without having to first acquire permission of copyright holder. So what comes under fair use? Brief experts of copyrighted material may under certain circumstances be quoted verbatim for purpose such as criticism, news reporting, teaching and research without the need of for permission from the or payment to the copyright holder. See, copyright holder have the rights on its resources. So before using that material, you have to take permission. Permission is given in the form of license, right? It can be free of cost. It can be on cost basis or it can be uh, under certain restrictions. But even the copyrighted material can be used for five purposes without the prior permission from the copyright holders. And these five conditions I have already quoted that are 
for criticism, for news reporting, teaching and research, right? These are some of the uh, areas where prior permission is not required and it is covered under fair use. And there is one more important term that is known as public domain. So what is public domain? You can see the logo of public domain in the top right corner of the slide. Whenever you see this picture, this image, you can easily identify that the resource containing this image is released under public domain license. So what is public domain? Public domain is a state of being available to the public and not subject to copyright. So there are three main categories of public domain licenses. Number one, works that are automatically entered the public domain upon creation and not copyrighted, like government policies, right? The policy documents at times, uh, they are automatically in the public domain. You can all, all use them, right? Second condition is works has been assigned to the public domain by the creator. The creates, creator or the author himself released the resources under the public domain license. And the third category is work that have entered the public domain because the copyright of them have expired. The copyright is given for certain duration. Once that duration completes, the work automatically comes under public domain. So you don't have to um, take prior permission then. Like uh, the example is Project Gutenberg. You can Google it and search Project Gutenberg and you will find the stories, the manuscript of the old authors and the famous writers under this uh, uh, website and they are copyright free now. I mean, they are under public domain license. So why we should consider licensing? <clears throat> the first reason is copyright law allows licensing of works. Licensing enables others to use a copyrighted work in lawful manner. Licensing can be for economic considerations to free. See, copyright gives you the ownership by through license, the copyright owner give permission to others how to use that resource, right? It eases the process of greater use and distribution of the work. So these are some of the reasons why should why you should or an author should consider licensing. So, As I've already stated that most common way the OER materials are released is under Creative Commons licenses. <clears throat> there are six standard Creative Commons licenses, which are a combination of four conditions. The right hand side of the screen shows these four conditions. These four conditions are attribution, non-commercial, no derivative work, and share alike. So what do you mean by attribution? First of all, I'll discuss these four conditions and details, and then we'll discuss six creative common open licenses, which are combination of these four conditions. The first condition is attribution. This according, I mean, this means that whenever you use a particular material, open uh, uh, any resources which are released under open licenses, you have to attribute to the original author or the original creator of that resource. 
because at times it can be a video it can be an audio it can be an animation so i am using the term educational resources right attribution means you have to give credit to the original author like we give credit in our research paper right and it is denoted by by whenever you see by term in license that means you have to give attribution to the original author second condition is non commercial non commercial means that you can retain reuse you can do all the five r activities with this material but for non commercial purposes only right it should the terms says that it can be reused retained redistributed and revised but for non commercial purposes only and this is denoted by nc third condition is nd that is no derivative work that means you can share or use the content in its original form only and you cannot make any revision you cannot edit it you cannot revise it you have to use the resource and as it is form only and fourth condition is share alike which is denoted by sa and this condition means that you have to reshare see suppose you have adopted some educational resources for developing a lecture note or some book or some paper right if you are using any resource which is released under this sa condition the derivative work that you are producing using that resource should be re, uh, released under the identical license terms you cannot change the license terms the resultant document should be shared with others under the identical license terms so these are four conditions based on these four conditions there are six creative common open licenses that i will discuss one by one the first license is you can see in the left hand side of this screen the first license is cc by and this is denoted by this symbol you can see the logo of this license right so whenever you see this logo you can easily tell that material that is released under this license term that is cc by you can use it for any purpose even for commercial purpose you can make revisions in uh, that resource you can retain you can revise you can re redistribute but you have to give credit to the original author or original contributor this is the only, only uh, constraint see by these uh, six different types of license the user the original author is dictating how this material can be used reused under what restrictions it can be used the first type of license is ccby whenever you see this license you can easily identify that you can use this resource for any purpose provided you attribute to the original country right 
Second type of license is CCBUISA. CC stands for Creative Commons. So it is common in all the six licenses, right? So CCBUISA. BYSA means we have already discussed it. BY means you have to give attribution to the original author. And SA means the resultant document that you are preparing using that original resource should be released under same license, same license terms, right? Third type of license is CC, BY, and C. Now you can easily tell that the resource released under this license can be reused, re revised, reshared under two restrictions. The first restriction is you have to attribute to the original creator. And second restriction is it cannot be used for commercial purpose. It can be used for non-commercial purposes. Fourth license is PYNCSA. CC is common to all, so I am skipping that term. BYNCSA. Now you can easily tell BY means you have to give the attribution to the original <coughs> author. NC means non commercial. And SA means share alike. You have to release the resultant document under the same license condition. Fifth type of license is BY and D. Again, BY is you have to attribute to the original creator and ND means no derivative. You cannot revise it. You have to share it in the original form only. You cannot make any revisions. You cannot edit it. You cannot share part of it. You have to share the whole document as it is. And sixth and the last licenses by nc nd by is again by attribution nc means non commercial and nd means non derivative so whenever you see this symbol you can easily identify that the resource released under this license can be reused under Three restrictions. First restriction is whenever you use it, you have to attribute to the original creator. Second restriction is it cannot be used for commercial purpose. Third restriction is derivative work is not allowed. You cannot make deri derivative work out of the original work. You have to share this resource under the original license. So these are six Creative Commons licenses. Now there are, see, Creative Commons is one of the type of open license. There are other open licenses available in the market that maybe you have encountered. Uh, like I'll share some of the licenses. One is Crown Copyright. Most of the resources which are developed in UK are released under Crown Copyright. You can, you can it, uh, the license terms are visible in the screen. You can clearly relate that the license terms are similar to Creative Commons. You are free to copy, distribute, and transmit the information, adapt the information, exploit the information commercially, whether by sublicensing it, combining it, or mixing with other information or data, or by including it in your own product or application. So this is this sounds similar to Creative Commons. There are other variants also. So one of the variants is Crown Commons. 
Next, we have GFDL, that is GNU Free Documentation License. So this is the logo. Normally, it is used for software products. Free and open source softwares are released under these licenses. And some of the manuals also are released under this license. So there are certain uh, variations, variants of uh, open licenses in the market, right? So by now, we understand what is an OER. OER is any teaching or a research material which is available under a public domain or is released under an open license. So how to search educational resources? Now we'll discuss this. There are three popular ways to search OERs. Number one is through directories, through platforms, and number three is repositories. So let us first discuss what is a directory. A directory provides list of OER and links to resources available elsewhere on the web. So some of the common OER directories are OER Commons, COL OER directories, Directory of Open Access Journals, Public Library of Science. These are some of the examples of the directory, OER directory. Next is platform. By platform, we mean specific digital tools designed to do something with the OER. This could include tools to develop new or adapt existing OERs. Alternatively, the platform could be designed to license new OERs with an open license. Some of the popular OER platforms are Wikipedia and OER Commons. So you can find OER material in these platforms also. Next is repositories. What is a repository? A repository is a database or collection of OER, usually once developed by a particular institute, <clears throat> right? Some of the examples of OER repositories are OpenStax, Open Textbook Library, Open Courseware, Open Learning Initiative by Carnegie Mellon University. Then we have OER Commons, JHS PH Open Courseware, Merlot, they are, these are examples of some of the OER repositories where you can find OER material, live in OER material. So now we'll take one of the platform that is Open Textbook Library and see how we can find a textbook or an educational resources related to a particular area of study. So this is the landing page of this website. Website is open.umn.ed, right? Whenever you type this, this will be the landing page, right? So there are options to browse the content using, I mean, you can browse subject-wise, recent reviews, and new books. When you, whenever you click on browse subjects, you'll find a list of subjects that are available, right? Suppose I click on computer science books and There is a book named Applied Probability. So whenever you click on that book, you will find the table of contents about the course, metadata about the uh, content, that is writer's name, affiliation, 
publication date, ISBN, and this material is available in EPUB and PDF form. And this is the condition of use, where it is clearly stated that you can use this book under these license conditions. And this license condition is CCBY. This means that this, the content of this book can be reused, retained, revised, redistributed by any person who have the access to it, provided you attribute the original author. Suppose I am writing a book, I am developing course material in applied probability. I have developed all the chapters except this ch chapter number 16, that is random selection. I don't have specialization in that subject, but according to the syllabus, this topic should be included. So what I can do is take this chapter 16 random selection in my work, my existing work, copy it there, put the attribution that this work has been adopted from a book called Applied Probability by Paul from Rice University. If ISBN number is provided, you can provide that and you can provide the link also, right? And you can use it. Right? So there are no other restrictions involved. Right? So based on the intention of the use, of your use you are planning, you can search the material under appropriate license terms. You can also search these OER materials using Google search engine only. But it needs special skills. That, that's also I'll discuss. But Whenever you use a platform, you have a flexibility that you don't have to bother whether this material is an OER or not, because all the material that is available under OER directory or OER platform, it is an OER, hundred percent for sure. But you have to check, you have to check this resource is released under which license. So there is a guarantee that is it is an OER. You just have to check the license condition. As I've already stated that these repositories are owned by some institutions or by universities or by organization. So at times there are restrictions on who will upload data on these platforms. Suppose I am revising, I am writing a book on applied probability. This book is written in 2019. There are some new concepts, supposedly, that are introduced. So I am writing a revised version for this book, which will contain the latest development also in this field. And, but I cannot host that revised version in this platform because this platform is maybe um, owned by some universities and I need to be a faculty member or a student of that uh, university to be able to upload that content. Meaning thereby, what I want to convey is, at times there are better materials available in open internet, but it needs special skills to find those materials from Google searching. So I'll show you uh, how we can search uh, OER material using Google search engine. But before that, I want to demonstrate one more OER repository that, that is JHS PH Open. It is especially focused for medical sciences. And you can see in the right hand bottom size CC is there. That means the content released under this websites are OERs. See, you can see here also in the bottom of the page. 
copyright 2019 the john hopkins university creative commons pync sa that means you can reuse the content just by giving the attribution to the original author for non commercial purposes and share alike condition right so how it looks like if you browse the list you can browse the list course wise topic wise collection wise and image wise right suppose i click on course wise these are the list of courses that are available suppose i click on principle of drug development so this is a video instructor is charles originally offered in fall of 2007 offer to graduate training program in clinical investigations course number is, is this and this is the license term right that means you can reuse this material for non commercial purposes and the license should be same same license should be used in the resultant document or the resultant resource right again we'll come back uh, we were discussing about how to search oer material using google so this is the google page suppose i want an educational material on organic chemistry i'll write the keyword here and click search as soon as you click search button all the resources whether they are operated material or they are released under open license they all will be displayed now what you have to do is click on individual link go to the home page check for the license terms discard the pages that are not uh, that are copyrighted and save the pages or the resource which are available on under open license but it is a very tedious exercise so this google provides an advanced search facility to facilitate search for open educational resources so whenever you type a keyword press enter you will find this tab google here you will find setting tab you click on that you will get a drop down list here you will find advanced search click on advanced search here in the last in the bottom of the page you will find an entry with name uses rights and whenever you will click on this you will find a drop down list with three options five options in so based on the intention of your use you can select the appropriate term first is not filtered by license it will return all the types of resources whether they are oer or they are not oer second is free to use or share this sounds like an oer free to use or share even commercially free to use share or modify free to use share or modify even commercially so these are some of the type of restrictions so you can select the appropriate term and save it after saving this settings if you type the keyword organic chemistry all the you know links that are returned they will be definitely oers again you have to check for the license terms right so the first link is introduction to organic structure and bonding i click down this link see it re redirected me to this page and i told you that this will be an oer right 100% because i have filtered that page how to check whether it is an oer or not just go to the bottom of the page see this the libre text library are powered by mind touch and are based upon work supported by this organization unless otherwise noted the libre text library is licensed under a creative common attribution 
non commercial share alike 3.0 version right so by looking at these terms you can easily identify that it is an oer so we have discussed two strategies to search for an oer one is using platforms second is using google advanced search now suppose you have some material with you and you have developed that material using some oer material resources from the internet and now you want to release it under open license so how to do that first part is how to search material appropriate material for reuse second is after reuse you have to or you want to release that content as an oer so how to do that just go to a website called creativecommons.org the screen shows the landing page of that website and this here you will find a tab named share your work as soon as you click on that it will land you to this page choose a license click on get started so here are, are some conditions that you have to click on it is as simple as that you just have to make three clicks and your license is ready the first question is allow adaptation of your work to be shared you have to just specify yes no or third option is yes as long as other share alike so as in original creator or an author you have to dictate the restrictions under which this resource can be reused so the first question was related to the adaptation of the work and the second question just two questions and your license is ready second question is allow commercial work of your work yes or no based on your selection an appropriate license will be created for you automatically in this case for example i have selected yes as long as share alike so this is related to sa condition and allow commercial use of your work no so that means it will uh, it will place nc condition right so after this you just click enter this is the license that is generated this work is licensed under creative commons attribution non commercial share alike international license 4.0 so based on the terms that you want to release your resource this license will be generated had i uh, you know if i have chosen yes here then nc condition would not be there since i have selected no here allow commercial use of your work no so that's why non commercial clause is added here you can directly copy and paste this statement in the web page or the resource where you are planning to the resource you are planning to release under open license or alternatively you can use this logo and paste it and if you want to embed that license in your web page you can copy this code and embed it in your web page it is as simple as that your license is ready so there are at times conditions when a uh, certain you have developed some book or a resource and you suppose you have released that book under cc by sa license but certain chapter which you have used is available under different license so you can 
also write a disclaimer here in this case you can see that this license is pasted or available in a resource called this uh, i'm just uh, reading out the license statement this unit was adapted from oer and developed further by monica these are the authors the unit was revised by no these are the person who make the revision and this resource is released in the ccby sa license so what are the conditions of that that license all materials in this kenya ict cft coursework is licensed by the ministry of education science and technology kenya under a creative common attribution share alike license international license with the exception of resources listed below one of the chapter or unit that is introduction to ict is not released under this license and all the other part is released under ccby sa license so this is how you can mark exceptions in that resource right so this was all from my side today we discussed what is an oer then we discussed what is copyright fair use and what is public domain then we also discussed what is an open license what is creative common license what are the four conditions and how six different licenses are available under uh, by combination of these four conditions then we discussed how to search oer materials using repository platform and directories then we also learned how to search oer using google search engine and at last we have discussed how to share a educational resource or any resource under an open license right now i want to share two video links with you give me 5 minutes i found these two short clips very useful so i want to share these resources with you all give me 5 minutes i am sharing this clip that is copyright basics it is a 6 minute clip please go through it and after that i'll share one more 2 minute clip then we'll go for question and answers i hope this screen is visible to you now Hey Jim, thanks for that report you gave me the other day. My client loved it. You gave it to your client? No. Oh. I made a copy for him. We have a limited subscription to those reports. You can't copy them or distribute them without permission. Really? Yeah. Jeez. Next thing I know, you'll be posting stuff like that to the web and emailing it all over the place. We're not supposed to do that either. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Intellectual property like published reports, articles, and content you find on the web has to be managed carefully. We have to balance its use with our rights, licenses and copyright requirements. I know. I read our copyright policy when I joined the company. Good. That's a start, but it really comes down to what we do on a daily basis. 
If you have a few minutes, I can explain the basics of copyright to you. Okay. Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution gives Congress the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing, for limited times, to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. It means that in the United States, a copyright holder has some exclusive rights to his or her work. And those rights are protected by U.S. copyright law. Oh, I, I always thought no copyright symbol, no problem. Nope. Copyright is automatic. As soon as something is captured in a fixed format, such as being written down or recorded, it is protected by copyright. Neither registration or publication are required, nor is the use of the copyright symbol. Although, it's a good idea to use the copyright symbol as it reminds people that the work is protected by copyright. So what are the copyright holder's rights? Copyright holders have the exclusive right to copy, distribute, perform, and display their work, and the right to create a derivative work like when a book is made into a movie. This is why you may need permission if you want to email a research report to your project team or a customer, post an article or report on a company wiki or an internet site, reprint articles in a company newsletter, post a news story about our company on our website, or make a photocopy of a newspaper article to hand out at a meeting. Really? For everything? Well, a lot of things, such as books, magazine and online articles, songs, screenplays, choreography, photos, artwork, podcasts, and software. They're all protected by copyright. But not everything. Ideas, facts, and data are not protected by copyright law. Logos and taglines aren't either, although they might be protected by trademark law. Anything created by the U.S. government is not covered by copyright law. Uh, neither are works for which the copyright has expired. But what about fair use? If it's for our research, doesn't fair use mean I can use the material? Maybe. Fair use recognizes that certain uses of the copyright-protected work do not require permission from the copyright holder. Fair use allows for the use of the copyright-protected work for commentary, parody, news reporting, research, and education. The U.S. Copyright Act lists four factors to help determine when a use may be considered fair use. The first is the purpose and character of the use. If the use is intended to help derive financial or other business benefit, then it is less likely to be considered fair use. That usually ends the analysis for most business uses. Next is the nature of the copyrighted work. The use of a purely factual work is more likely to be considered fair use than the use of a creative work. Third, an evaluation of the amount and substantiality considers how much of the work was used. Even a small portion may be too much to qualify as fair use if what is used is the heart of the work. And finally, fair use considers the effect of the use on the market or the potential market. If your use is likely to result in economic loss to the copyright holder, then it is less likely to be considered fair use. None of these factors alone is enough to determine fair use. You have to weigh all four in order to determine if the use is really fair use. Oh. This stuff is confusing. For example, many people confuse the physical ownership of a book or a CD with owning the copyright to that work. The first sale doctrine permits lending, reselling, disposing, etc. of the item, but it does not permit reproducing the material, performing it, or any of the copyright holder's other exclusive rights. Attribution is another area of confusion. People think if they just cite their source, they're good to go. But attribution is not a substitute for copyright permission. If the work is protected by copyright, you must obtain permission from the copyright holder or their agent in order to use it. And lots of people confuse the legal concept of the public domain with the fact that a work may be publicly available, such as information found in books or on the internet. The public domain comprises all copyright or never were. Oh, I see. Most people do not intentionally violate copyright law. Like you, they are simply unaware of their responsibilities as they go about their everyday activities, which often involve the use and distribution of published information. Is this a big problem? Imagine millions of employees moving billions of documents around the world with no idea what their copyright responsibilities are. It kills me. I guess it is a big problem. But does it really matter? I mean, who's going to know? It matters for many reasons. First and foremost, it's the law. It's unlawful to infringe on the rights of copyright holders. They can sue for damages or to recoup lost profits as a result of infringement, which is costly and, well, it looks bad for the company. It's also a matter of ethics. Demonstrating respect for the rights of copyright holders is simply the right thing to do. When we generate intellectual property, we want our rights respected, so we should respect the rights of others. And finally, copyright ensures the continued availability of the high-value material we rely on. Our needs are served by copyright holders' information development, and the royalties we pay fuel further development. Very interesting. So what do we do when we want to use copyrighted information? I'm always here to help, but the best advice I can give you is know the facts, remember your responsibilities, and when in doubt, get permission.
So this was one of the video, a short two minute video for Creative Commons licenses. I think it will be beneficial for you all to revise what I have already spoken about. Just give me two minutes. I'll play that video. I hope this screen is visible to you and it is audible. Hey, Jim, thanks for that report you gave me the other day. My client loved it. You gave it to your client? No, sorry, this I is made a, a copy for him. Sorry, sorry. This is the same. Same video, sorry. I'll share a short two, three minutes video on how to combine licenses. I hope this is visible and audible to you. With so many new tools and ways to use technology, Open Educational Resources, or OER, have become an important supply from which to draw when developing instructional content. OER are educational materials produced by one party that are licensed to be shared freely and at no cost by others. Let's examine the process of finding and using OER and how to handle the complications that can arise when combining materials with different licenses. There are many open licenses, but Creative Commons licenses are the ones we will be working with here. So how do you go about finding and using OER? Let's watch Michelle as she develops a chapter for an open textbook on metabolism. Michelle has been teaching metabolism for years, so she has already developed the text of the chapter from her notes. But she needs some illustrations, specifically of the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. She'd also like to find some exercises to accompany the text. There are many places to find OER, such as Flickr CC, OER Commons, Connections, Internet Archive, or Open Michigan. Michelle goes to Flickr CC at flickr.com slash creative commons. That brings her to a collection of all the Flickr images that have creative commons licenses. She quickly finds the images she's looking for. Both with CC by licenses. For exercises, she logs into the Orange Grove, Florida's digital repository where a wide range of OER are available. Here she searches for electron transport chain and turns up some exercise test questions also licensed CC BY. Because there are no restrictions on these images or exercises, Michelle is free to modify them to suit her needs. She resizes and crops the images and writes captions for them. Then for each image, she provides the specific Creative Commons license with a link back to its license deed. Next, she writes the creator's name, linking back to the Flickr site where she found the image. She also adds some references to the images in her text. She then adds the exercises at the end, removes two that do not belong in her chapter, provides attribution to the creator, 
and links back to the resource. Then she uses the Accessibility Checker utility in Microsoft Word, which spots content that may pose challenges for persons with disabilities. When Michelle saves her book, she notices the metadata text fields at the bottom of the Save As window. Her name is already listed as author. She could add more names if she had co-authors. She enters the title and subject, then several tags that describe the content of her work. When Michelle clicks Save, the metadata is embedded in the document. Finally, she adds a Creative Commons license. Because the other content she is using has CC BY licenses, the least restrictive license available, she is free to choose the license she wants. She goes to the Creative Commons page to choose a license. She answers a few questions and her license is selected automatically. She then fills in some information to help others provide proper attribution for her work and the chooser automatically generates text and code for her document. She copies the text and pastes it onto the first page of her chapter. A job well done, Michelle. Thanks. Michelle used the Buy license, which made licensing her new work easy. But not all licenses play well with others. Let's consider some situations where the licenses being combined are more restrictive. Suppose you are developing a work and you want to use some other CC licensed works within yours. If you adapt or derive works offered under Creative Commons licenses, you must not only follow the terms of the licenses involved, but also choose a license for your work that is compatible with the licenses of the works you are using. If a license of a work you want to use is not compatible with yours or another work you plan to use, search for a comparable work with a compatible license or try to contact the rights holder and request permission to use the work under your license. New email. So which licenses are compatible and which are not? The buy license is compatible with any other Creative Commons license, so you can use it with attribution, of course, any way you like. Sometimes the buy license has the no derivatives or ND provision. The ND provision prohibits the works from being adapted, revised, or combined at all. With a share alike or SA provision, your new work must have an identical license as the source content. In other words, this license lets others remix, tweak, and build upon a work, as long as they credit the creator and license their derivatives under identical terms. Finally, the non-commercial or NC provision makes the license compatible with any of the three licenses with an NC component. By NC itself, by NC SA, or even by NC and D. This is Andrea and Charles. Hi. Hello. They are each developing their own chapters of an open textbook to be licensed separately. That's right. When they have questions about which license to use, they ask Beth, the scholarly communications librarian. Beth is considered the leading expert on campus in Creative Commons licensing. Most people think she's pretty cool. Andrea and Charles would agree. Andrea has found two resources that she wants to use with her own writing. One is an extensive table with useful information for students. The other is a diagram that shows the relationships among complex variables in a way that makes them easier for students to grasp. The table is found in a work with an attribution license. The diagram carries an attribution non-commercial license. She is confident she can use these assets for her open textbook chapter, but she wonders what licenses she can apply to her finished work. Considering the stipulations of the Buy NC license, she figures she can use a Buy NC, a Buy NC SA, or a Buy NC ND license. Right, Beth? Great. Now it's Charles' turn. Charles also has two resources that he wants to use with his chapter. One is a photograph with an attribution share alike license, and the other is a set of exercises with an attribution non-commercial license. 
He figures he can cover them both by licensing his chapter with a buy NCSA license. Beth? No way, Chuck. Not unless you obtain permission from the photographer. Share alike means you have to use the exact same license, and the buy NC license of the exercises won't let you do that. Well, what if I use this resource? Buy license? You're good to go. Thanks, guys. No, no problem. problem. When it comes down to it, some combinations of licenses just aren't compatible, and some combinations, like Andrea's, give several options. Fortunately, the number of resources with open licenses is huge, and it's growing every day. So don't give up if the work you want to use has an incompatible license. There's plenty, and that's it. It's pretty easy when you get the hang of it. Now you'll be able to produce properly licensed open educational resources that could benefit many people. So good luck. So I hope that these short video clips have improved your understanding about your about the OERs. Now the house is open for questions. If you have any questions, you are free to ask now. Sir, so actually, we have not given right to unmute. Okay, okay. Uh, to the participant, unmute right. So they will ask question on chat box. Okay. Uh, so I'll open the chat box. Any questions from your side? You can type it on the chat box and we'll answer those questions. We'll try to answer those questions. Question from Mr. Jitendra Guanchi, which license refer code for educational institute? Uh, Jitendra ji, there is no specific license code allocated for educational institute. It depends on your intention, what restrictions you want to uh, apply on your the uh, resource you have created so based on that restrictions or if you have used certain oers for developing your content if there is certain restrictions from that uh, license that license applies there is no specific code allocated for educational institutes any other question i hope i have answered your question Any other question? I think there are no more questions. Uh, so I hand over the session back to Ashutosh ji. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thanks once again. And uh, Wonderfully, you have explained all the things. As you said initially that AICT is not entertaining 
to any institution uh, for any new course uh, which is not related to artificial intelligence or machine learning so uh, i think at this time it is very important to learn about this ai and uh, machine learning uh, uh, and also same time we have huge amount of data many time we are talking about the big data so uh, this uh, huge amount of data many time uh, we uh, prepare or send any document uh, which is many time copied from other uh, sources even uh, last time we are submitting some project in any uh, organization so uh, they have strictly uh, ruled that uh, no project will be submitted without uh, without any uh, plagiarism check so it is very important this time so oer and uh, this uh, uh, open education licensing and copyright is very important and we should understand and we should have at least knowledge of these all things and uh, many time we have to search machine learning data and data from uh, data about artificial intelligence so we should know what is oer licensing how to search that machine learning uh, data or identify this data uh, which is trusted source and where we should search it so identification of educational resources related to machine learning uh, using open educational uh, resources so uh, this lecture will be milestone for we all uh, all of us and we uh, i hope that participant has enjoyed this lecture and you have covered uh, everything and uh, you have given uh, wonderfully you have presented all the topics in your slide as well as you have given this video also uh, which is very informative so uh, thank you very much sir uh, and um, i hope uh, the student or uh, participant here so participant will uh, enjoy it and will learn more about this um, oer and all so thanks once again and thank you very much thank you very much thank you very much namaskar so uh, after half an hour we will again meet so this is pre break and uh, right now 10:40 so uh, around 11 10 we will meet again for the next session and next session will be taken by professor rk shivastav professor rk shivastav is head department of computer science and engineering dr sakuntala mr national rehabilitation university lucknow and his topic ann in machine learning so um, uh, we will meet again at 10 uh, 11 10 thank you once again thank you participant
गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग सर आई हैव गिवन यू द राइट ऑफ को होस्ट एंड नाउ यू कैन शेयर योर स्लाइड्स सो सेल वी स्टार्ट सर या या श्योर सो वेलकम पार्टिसिपेंट एंड वेलकम प्रोफेसर आर के श्रीवास्तव सर सो दिस इज फोर्थ डे ऑफ दिस एफ डी पी ऑन एडवांसेज ऑफ आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस एंड मशीन लर्निंग इन सोसाइटल डेवलपमेंट and this is session 11 so first of all i welcome professor rk shivastav sir professor rk shivastav is professor and dean in department of computer science and it in the dr sarkuntla mishra national rehabilitational university lucknow he is senior member of up council of science and technology technical advisory board agriculture scientist recruitment board new delhi and member of ibri in assessment committee he is subject expert in different selection committee of various state and central university professor srivastava is member of board of study of mjp ruhilkand university member of academic council of dr sakuntala mishra national rehabilitational university lucknow he is appointed as subject expert in different public service commission for computer science and information technology nominated in expert panel of aict and he is also nominated nac assessor for peer review of institutions in india so uh, i again welcome professor shivasto sir sir over to you sir please sir thank you okay yes sir yes sir you can now and voice is very clear sir very well, now okay good morning to all of you the topic of my lecture is nn in machine learning artificial neural network in machine learning first of all whether is this nn or machine learning both are the branch of uh, artificial intelligence artificial intelligence is the replication of human behavior with the aid of machine here the uh, sharing the knowledge with the aid of machine because human is being treated as intelligent because of uh, a lot of thinking decision making as well as for different uh, intelligent systems so the human is being uh, uh, treated as intelligent artificial neural network is again the replication of human behavior now the machine learning as well as the artificial neural network both are the branch of this ai artificial intelligence first of all machine learning what is machine learning it is as uh, i discuss that uh, machine learning is the field of uh, artificial uh, artificial intelligence so this is the machine learning is the branch which is based on the idea that system can learn from data it learn from the set of data from uh, kind of data from group of data as well as uh, for the uh, pattern recognition identification of that pattern classification decision making and all these things so the uh, machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence and computer science which focuses on the idea that system can learn from the data and algorithm to imitate the way that human learn gradually improving its accuracy 
again machine learning is an important component of the growing field of the data science through the use of statistical method algorithms are trained to make the classification or prediction and converging the key insights within the data mining project the basic model of the machine learning actually fundamental of the learning is is the fundamental of the learning uh, machine learning is what the learning learning through the data learning through the train so who is learning the computer program is learning what is learned that is the domain of data from what the learning is uh, learner is learning the information source the machine learning is buzzword in the technology world right now and good reason it represents a major step forward in how computer can learn there are the 10 programming languages for uh, machine learning top 10 that is the python r programming javascript java julia lisp scala c c++ type step which are compatible to the machine learning uh, history of machine learning the concept of the machine learning came from the picture in 1950 when alan turing published a paper answering the question can machine think it comes from that in 1950 in 1957 frank rosenblatt designed the first neural network for computers which is now commonly called perceptron there are the different applications of the machine language like social media transportation products recommendation virtual personal assistant self driving cars dynamic pricing google translate online video streaming fraud detection etc and then now the topic is nn in machine learning artificial neural network are the most popular machine learning algorithms today actually artificial neural network is totally based on the process where the network learns from the data again here machine language is based on the learning from data so the invention of these neural networks took place in 1970 but they have achieved huge popularity due to the recent increase in computation power because of which they are now virtually everywhere in every application that we use neural network power the intelligent interface that keep us engaged now the question arises where can neural network system can help where we can use the neural network system why not ordinary programming language conventional programming language where we cannot formulate an algorithms algorithmic solution algorithmic solution we can make the program to perform to solve any problem with the help of computer when there is some formula when there is some uh, idea of uh, train that is it is based on particular formula and we uh, put the formula give give the input put the formula solve it process it and get the result but there are different type of problems where we cannot formulate the algorithm that uh, for example if the problem is non linear and in various non linear problem 
no mathematical formula, neither any statistical uh, rule can help us. Uh, for example, any uh, production of the agriculture crops. In some year, it is very huge. In some other year, it is very less. Again, it is high. So there are the different type of problems. There are the different type of uh, statistical data where we cannot formulate the uh, train or any uh, AP, GP, HP. There is no such type of progression. So we are helpless to design the algorithm. For that type of problem, we can use the neural network system where we can learn the end of the data and, form, and then formulate, then train the data. After training the data, we, we prepare some type of smart system and then use for a uh, data which uh, on which we can predict, we can classify, we can give the uh, further uh, output. Where we can get lots of example on the behavior we need. Second, when we have a lot of examples, then we can use the neural network. Where we need to pick out the structure from the existing data. So, the, an artificial neural network is an information processing system that is inspired by the way uh, biological nervous system. It is inspired by the biological neurons. The key element of this system is novel structure of the information processing system. It is composed of a large number of highly interconnected processing elements that simulates the behavior aspect of the biological neural network. Artificial neural networks are a special type of machine learning algorithm that are modeled after the human brain. That is just like how the neurons in our nervous systems are able to learn from the past data. Similarly, the NN is able to learn from the data and provide responses in the form of prediction or classification. It resembles brain in two respects. Number one, knowledge is acquired by the network through the learning process. Second, interneuron connection strengths known as synaptic weights are used to store the knowledge. Why we use neural network? Neural network with their remarkable ability to derive meaning from complicated or imprecise data can be used to extract the patterns and detect things that are too complex to be noticed by either humans or other computer techniques. A trained neural network can be thought of as expert. Other advantage, adaptive learning and ability to learn how to do tasks based on the data given for the training or initial experience. Self-organization and NN can create its own organization on or representation of the information it receives during the learning time. Real-time operations and then computations may be carried out in parallel with the special hardware devices are being designed, which take advantage of this capability. Fault tolerance via redundant information coding, partial 
destruction of the network leads to the corresponding degradation of the performance. However, the some network capabilities may be retained even with the major network damage. In very common example, uh, you can understand the basic theme of neural network, the participants who are not very much known with the artificial intelligence or neural network. Uh, here, I'm giving very uh, common example, very uh, uh, the, uh, the example in terms of a very layman. Uh, in starting, when the child born, the bacha chota hota hai, or thoda sa grow hone lagta hai, when it is being going up to the age of uh, one year, then every mother is trying to learn the various things which are around, uh, around the child. Like uh, whenever the child is uh, being familiar with the dog, uh, cow, etc. Then mother say, uh, this is cow. Jamma kehti hai ki ye cow hai. It is cow. It is goat. It is dog. So when mother says this is this, this is this, this is this, then again mother asks to the child, ki, what is this? Then the child suddenly mistakes and say the dog for cow, goat for dog. Then again, mother instead, no, it is uh, you, it is cow. Aksar hota hai ghar mein. Ye cow hai. Ye goat hai. Ye sab, ye goat hai. Ye, sorry, ye aapka buffalo hai. Ye aapka ye, ye monkey hai. Ye donkey hai. To bacha pehle kya hota hai? He, he is being confused. What, what is this? But when you try to learn many times, then after uh, recovering the error, after uh, every time of repeated time of learning, uh, the child is able to detect the correct, correct thing. That is whether monkey is monkey, dog is dog, goat is goat. So uh, after various type of time of learning, he, the child is being able to detect the particular correct thing. Similarly, uh, it is very common in every house that uh, when any guest comes to the house, mother will say, uh, where is I? So, bacha kya hota hai? Aksar kehta hai ki ear ki taraf le jata hai, kehta hai, ye, it is I. No, mother phir tokti hai, kehta no, 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 I is this. So, ek level ke baat kya hota, after some time of learning various times, uh, the child is now able to detect and say uh, the correct thing that it is I, it is ear, it is nose. In the same way, the, our network will learn from the different, uh, the set of data, learn the pattern, remove the errors, reduce the errors, and it becomes, when it becomes the train smart system, train pattern, what, uh, what is the uh, learning pattern? When the uh, neural network learn from the various set of data or trend of data, it uh, stores the, that information in terms of synaptic waves. There is a synaptic waves. And uh, there are the different algorithms by which it first it trained 
through the some type of forward by for, uh, some type of uh, forward uh, uh, landing and again reducing the error. So there are the different type of algorithm like back propagation and etc. So here the neural network in our practice, there are the different applications like sales forecasting, industrial process control, customer research, data validation, risk management, target marketing. Now the term biological neurons, how our uh, neuron is resembling to the biological neurons. A biological neuron may have as many as 10,000 different inputs and may send its output to other neurons. Neurons are wired up in a three-dimensional pattern. Real brains, however, are orders of magnitude more complex than any artificial neural network so far considered. Historical background, first artificial neuron was produced in 1943 by neurophysicist Mike uh, and logician water pits. But technology available at that, that time did not allow them to produce, proceed much. During this period, when funding and professional support was minimal, the important advances were made by relatively few researchers. These pioneers were able to develop convincing technology which surpassed the limitation identified by Minsky and Paper. Minsky and Paper published a book in which they summed up general feeling of the frustration among the researchers. Currently, neural network enjoys the resurgence of interest and a corresponding increase in funding. The performance of at the core neural computation are the concept of distributed, adaptive, and non-linear computing. Normally, normally a uh, uh, neural network will have several layer of the piece that are processing elements. The most basic and commonly used neural network architecture is the multi-layer perceptron. The circles are the processing elements arranged in the layers, the left row is, uh, it is coming. Left row is the input layers. The middle row is the hidden layer. And the right row is the output layer. The lines are here, weighted connections. In your uh, neural networks, the inputs, and outputs, when there are two layers, then it is referred as single layer. And when there is a hidden layer also between the input and output, then it is referred as multi-layer network. The performance of the multi-layer perceptron is measured in terms of desired signal and error creation. The output of the network is compared with the desired response to produce an error. An algorithm called back propagation is used to adjust the weights in a small amount of time in a way that reduces the error. The network is trained by repeating this process many times. The goal of training is to reach an optimal solution based on the performance measurement. This is the back propagation algorithm in which we train the network, giving the input, process it, and it produces the result. Then compare with the target result. It is referred as supervised learning. 
when it is compared with the target output, then the target output is different from the uh, your gained output. So the difference is referred as error. And in forward biasing, it is being trained, and in reverse uh, for reverse uh, for, uh, pro processing, it is reduce the error by adjusting the synaptic weights. It is referred as your back propagation algorithm. So the different type of uh, time of iteration, it will reduce the error for up to some uh, remarkable uh, difference uh, that is very less in comparison to the, uh, in comparison to the particular amount, which can be finally ignored. That is the uh, difference between the desired output and outcome of the particular network. So when the difference is uh, up to some acceptance uh, amount, then it is uh, referred that the particular uh, network is being trained. So it is very common algorithm of the neural network that is the back propagation algorithm. So first we uh, trained the network. After training, we will uh, adopt this particular system for a new, new value, new prediction, new classification, etc., or new decision making. Neural networks are being used in different other things like an investment analysis, an attempt to predict the movement of stocks, currencies, etc., from the previous data. There, they are replacing earlier, simpler linear models. In signature analysis, as the mechanism for the comparing signatures made with those stored this is one of the one of the first large scale application of the neural network in usa and is also one of the first use of the neural network chip this signature analysis is again pattern recognition the different example of the pattern recognition is the signature analysis, thumb, ana uh, thumb impression analysis, uh, face analysis. So it is all example of the pattern recognition. In process control, there are the clearly applications to be made here, most process cannot be determined as computable algorithms. What happens in any process control, when we control anything for the processing, then again, it is some type of the predictions. How, up to what extent it should be controlled? Then all these uh, things can be performed with the help of our this uh, artificial neural network by training the uh, set of data and again apply on that trained data. In monitoring, networks have been used in monitor the state of aircraft engines by monitoring vibration level and sound Early warning of engine problems can be given. Uh, British Rail have also been testing a similar application monitoring diesel engines. In marketing, marketing is based on the somehow forecasting. So every type of for forecasting needs uh, to detect with the help of trained of data. If we have a large amount of trained of data, and as we have discussed here, that 
our neural network can work in in that case very successfully where there is no formulation where the data is having very much non linearity in every type of marketing there is a uh, uh, there is a set of data uh, data which is having very up and downs so when uh, that up and downs are also not very uh, set of some patterns sometimes it is very up sometimes it is down it is again up again down but not in the same way then it is very difficult to uh, formulate with some statistical uh, formula so at that time there is uh, this nn is very helpful helpful to uh, train the data through various type of uh, we have uh, the data in in a, in a very non linear patterns so it is very useful for the marketing purpose to forecast anything for the planning purpose uh, for the production purpose if uh, any factory any manufacturing uh, company how much uh, product can produce up to what extent extent of the time then uh, it is very very useful in the case of marketing the marketing have been used to improve the marketing mail sorts one technique is to run a test mail sorts and look at the pattern of the returns from this this pattern of the return is nothing but the past data past trend of the data which we train with the help of nn the idea is to find a predictive mapping from the data known about the clients to how they have responded the mapping is then used to direct for, uh, further mail sorts so it is again the use of neural network some real world applications quality control quality control is again uh, the set of criteria the some some product is having how much uh, have accuracy how much have the um, uh, quality uh, quality uh, products and uh, how we predict that uh, the particular item particular product is being perfect so it is again supervised thing ki someone is being supervising that the uh, standard form of particular product is this accuracy is this standard is this and uh, dimension is this so when we have decide a particular type of uh, standards then we we, uh, we have the different type of products and then we predict whether it is uh, it is uh, having the same criteria having the same standard or not by comparing that target value so again it is use of your neural network financial forecasting for government organization as well as the private organization uh financial forecasting is very much important uh, regarding the future planning all the government planning is based uh on the previous data previous outcomes so the financial forecasting is also being very uh, important application of the neural network and on the basis of this financial forecasting every big uh, private organization or government organization can plan for the future so uh, neural network 
again, when we have the different uh, up and downs in the data can help for the forecasting or the financial financial forecasting as well as, as, as well as the prediction for the future planning. Economic forecasting, again, similar things, the, how much amount of the uh, fund will have to be uh, planned for the particular uh, project. In that, all these things, again, it is the application of the neural network, credit rating, speech and pattern recognition. It is again very important. Uh, at, uh, nowadays, uh, there is a thumb impression, signature, impre signature analysis, uh, writing, handwriting analysis. So there are the different types of analysis and pattern recognition system we need in our daily life. Uh, so this speech and pattern recognition is very much important. Even speech recognition is uh, very important for the deaf students, deaf uh, people. Uh, the, here we have the very much uh, important applications and gift through this speech uh, recognition by which the uh, your uh, deaf persons can recognize some uh, uh, from this speech after this speech recognition it is being converted into the uh, again voice as well as the you can uh, make it in the form of text so the deaf person can uh, can uh, read the particular text so it will helpful first uh, any anything which we have the in terms of uh, audio this audio is being converted into the text and text can be readable by the deaf person so it is again very much helpful for the speech and pattern recognition uh, biomedical instrumentation uh, process modeling and management laboratory research oil and gas exploration healthcare cost reduction targeted marketing defense controlling machine diagnostic uh, security trading again uh, there are the different examples of the regarding your disease prediction nowadays cancer prediction uh, different type of cancer can be recognized by the pattern recognitions. Uh, we can, uh, we are able to detect the particular disease, like uh, forecasting of the heart diseases, etc. There are the different, very popular application of the neural network. Now, biological type of neural network networks. Now we are here uh, to discuss the biological type neural network by comparing this neural network to the artificial neural network. It is estimated that human brain contains over 100 billion neurons and 10 raised to 14, uh, 10 raised power 14 synapses in the human nervous system. Studies of the brain anatomy of the neurons indicate more than 1,000 synapses on the input and output of each neuron. Although the neuron switch time is about a million fold times slower than the current computer element, they have thousandfold greater connectivity than today's supercomputer. The main objective of the biological type neural nets is to develop a synthetic element for verifying hypothesis, connect, 
concerning biological systems, neurons, and the interconnection synapses constitute the key element of neural information processing. It is the picture of the single neuron. Here, there are the synapses, cell body, axon, dendrites. Uh, this neuron uh, is the biological neuron. But here, when we compare through the artificial neurons, then all the inputs are being taken by the this dendrites. It is cell body. Inputs are being uh, uh, gained from the dendrites, and output is being uh, getting from the axon. This this is the axon, and the output from one neuron is being transferred to the another neuron to the input uh, of the. Uh, uh, new, other, another neuron that, that is the dendrites of the another neuron. So it is the structure of the neuron. Most neurons possess tree like structure that is called dendrites, which receives the incoming signal from other neurons. Across junction, it is called the synapses. As here, it is the synapses, it is cell body, it is dendrites, where all the inputs are being received. This is axon, axon where, from where the output is being taken. So, uh, most neurons possess tree-like structures called dendrites, which receives the incoming signal from other neurons across the junction called synapses. There are three parts, parts of the neurons. Number one, the neuron cell body. Second, branching extensions called dendrites for receiving the input. Second, third one is the axon that carries the neurons output to the dendrites of the other neurons. How two, more, two or more neurons interact is not already well known. It's different for the different neurons. Generally speaking, a neuron sends its output to the neurons via its axon. An axon carries information through a series of actions, potential, or waves of the current that depends on the neuron's potential. This process is often modeled as a propagation rule. Represented by this net value Again, there is a term activation function. A neuron collects the signal at its synapses by summing the excitation and inbuilt influences acting on it. If the excitation influences are dominant, then neuron fires and sends the message to other neurons via the outgoing synapses. In this sense, the neuron function can be modeled as a simple threshold function. Neurons fires if the combined signal strength exceeds a certain threshold in the general case of the neurons, neuron value is given by an activation function. Uh, the concept of this activation function is what? When 
the synapses uh, well when the complete uh, strength of a particular neuron is having more than the threshold function then it fires means it is not necessary to uh, send the spike send the signal from one neuron one neuron to another neuron it depends how it is being activated and when it is being excited and the value is being above the particular threshold value only then it will fire because of this reason in uh, in any conventional uh, programming language when we prepare any uh, any program to solve any problem with the help of computer then uh, the when we we give the same input every time it will give the same output in conventional programming for example when you uh, make any program to calculate some result with in a very simple form just to calculate the interest for a given particular amount time and rate it will give the result of the interest as interest every time same when you give the data similar every time but in your uh, neural network case in your the when we train the data then it is not necessary to give the but uh, result every time same because there are the number of neurons some neurons one times fires another time it will not fire so the result will vary every time of the processing in the case of neural network so the uh, the, the reason is what the reason is this that if the excitation influences are dominant then the neuro neuron fires and send this message to other neurons neurons via the outgoing synapses in this sense the neuron function can be modeled as a simple threshold function f neuron fires if the combined signal strength exceed a certain threshold in the general case the neuron value is given by this activation function so it is not necessary that every time output of the new, uh, neural network is being same every time it will differ by some uh, uh, some number some something example a simple single unit adaptive network network the network has two inputs and one output here in this case the output is this one if this in i0 is an input w0 is the weight synaptic weight then if it is greater than 0 then it is one if it is less than or equal to 0 then it is zero if it is one then it will fire otherwise it will not fire so we want to learn simple this uh, it is or Uh, example or output of one if either i0 or i1 is one then only output will be one algorithms and architectures simple perceptron the network adopts as follows Uh, the the adoption of the network is the change weight by amount of proportional to the difference between the desired output and actual output uh, actually i have just discussed at the time of back, back propagation algorithm that is there are two types of uh, output one is the desired output and second one is the actual output desired is the uh, target value which is uh, which acts like a teacher 
in supervised learning. So the, this is the uh, formula difference uh, eta into d minus y into i1 the, where the eta is the learning rate, d is the desired output, y is the actual output. This is called perceptron learning, learning rule and goes back to the early 1960s. We expose the net to the patterns. There are two phases in neural information processing. They are the learning phase, the retrieving phase. In training phase, a training data set is used to determine the weight parameters that define the neural net model. The trained neural model will be used later in retrieving phase to process real test patterns and yield the classification, forecasting, uh, decision-making, every type of result, which is uh, first, as I discussed in, uh, at the time of uh, back propagation algorithm, uh, there are two phases. When we have the data sets, that is neurons, First, we train the data. Train the data means we get the uh, result of uh, different up and downs, different, uh, that, that is the trend of data, which, uh, which is varying from time to time. If we have the data of uh, last uh, 30 years, then in some years it is being up, down. So, the, the trend of the data which uh, the network learns is the phase of the training, training phase in which uh, the network learn the different trends of the data, ki what are the trends in the past. And it stores all these uh, trends in terms of the syn uh, synaptic weights. It is referred as uh, training phase. So, first one is the training phase. Just an example, diya tha abhi aapko ki bache ka ki jab bacha sikta hai ki ye eye hai, ye ear hai, ye hair hai, ye nose hai. That was the training phase. Jab wo training bar bar leta hai mother se, ye nose hai, ye eye hai, ye aise yo. So, our network, hai, uh, neural network. This neural network uh, being trained by having the different trains of the data, and that when we train the data, process the data, uh, it will differ from the actual result. When it differs from the actual result, again it is being processed, uh, repeated time process. Reducing the error, ultimately the uh, error or difference between the desired output and actual output is very less as accepting uh, value, then it is treated as our network is being conserved. And when our network is being conserved, then it is referred that our network is being trained. And when our network is being trained, then the first training phase is being completed. And all these uh, trained data, trained data means we, uh, in terms of all this uh, synaptic weights, we store all these trains in terms of synaptic weights. Then the network is referred as train. Just this train neural network will be used later in the retrieving phase to process real test patterns and yield classification result. Then this chain, when we have the chain net network, then whatever we have to uh, forecast, whatever we have to classify, we give the data and uh, by 
processing through this all these uh, synaptic waves we we are then able to find the yield uh, yield classification or yield uh, forecasting result um, in common our uh, familiar example when we say that mother is being trying to train her child then always it be happen when the child is being trained jab bachcha bilkul trained ho jata hai ko eye batata hai nose ko nose batata hai hair ko hair batata hai to wo new comers jo bhi ghar mein aate hain naye log tab mother unke samne kehti hai ki beta batao nose kahan hai kyunki wo jaanti hai ki ab trained ho gaya hai to jaise hi bachcha trained ho jata hai har cheez ko sahi tarike se batata hai bar bar tokte hue tokna kya hai एरर को रिमूव करना है एरर इज बीइंग रिमूविंग बाय एवरी टाइम हिटिंग इट इज दिस इट इज दिस दिस इज दिस लाइक दैट तो जब वो बता ट्रेन हो जाता है बच्चा कि इट इज हियर नोज हियर आई तो जब वो ट्रेन हो गया हो जाता है तो कोई गेस्ट आता है तो उसके सामने मदर उसको फेस करती है हां बताओ बेटा ये क्या है तो लोग खुश होते हैं कि देखो बच्चा बहुत समझदार हो गया है हैं उसको समझ में आने लगा कि ये ये नोज है ये आई है तो जब ये ये परफेक्शन हो जाती है तो इस स्टेज को हम क्या कहते हैं इस स्टेज को हम कहते हैं कि बच्चा जो ट्रेंड हो गया है हमारे आर्टिफिशियल न्यूरल नेटवर्क में क्या होगा कि हम आवर नेटवर्क इज बीइंग ट्रेंड ये हमारा फर्स्ट फेस है और जब गेस्ट आया और उसको मदर ने दिखाया कि देखो मेरा बेटा बिल्कुल ट्रेंड है ये ये है ये बता रहा है वो दूसरे बच्चे का कहेगी ये बताओ दूसरे बच्चे का नोज की तरफ इशारा करके क्या है तो कहेगा नोज तो ऐसी फॉर अवर क्लासिफिकेशन रिजल्ट विल बी ऑप्टेन बाय गिविंग द वैल्यू ऑफ द प्रेडिक्ट वैल्यू टू बी प्रेडिक्टेड और द वैल्यू इज बीइंग क्लासिफाइड then it is being operate on that chain network then we'll get the result this is the complete process of the artificial neural network there are the different uh, types of this neural network that is the supervised and supervised it is very overview of the this neural network so supervised learning rule uh we have uh, uh, discussed that the back propagation has the some teacher some target value when we have some target value some teacher to suggest the target then it is referred as supervised the training data consist of many pairs of input and output training patterns therefore the learning will benefit from the assistance of the teacher given a uh, new training pattern say we have trained up to m and m plus 1th the weight may be updated as this formula you can see this uh, formula by by this formula m plus 1th weights may be updated and unsupervised first one was the supervised second one is the unsupervised supervised me bilkul clear hai it is very clear that we have to train the network according to the particular desired value particular target value we have to train according to that uh, target value but in unsupervised learning rule there is no teacher there is no target value in this case the pattern is different for the unsupervised learning rule the training set consists of input training patterns only there are, therefore the network is trained without benefit of the teacher the network learns to adopt based on the experiences collected through the 
previous training pattern. Typical example of are the Habian learning rule. Uh, as far as Habian learning rule, Hab was a great psychologist and psychologist as well as the very great scientist in the field of uh, this artificial neural network also. So according to the Hab, bad people uh, comes in the group of bad, good people come in the group of good. So by that idea, when we have that certain group, then every group is having some common criteria. For example, in a starting the class, in one class, there are the different students coming from different regions, different backgrounds. But after some times, there are the different group of students. And the group of student is being forming by some uh, common criteria. And that common criteria uh, is uh, the reason for making the group. Maybe from a particular reason, may the particular uh, come from the particular same language area or from the rich background, from poor background. There are the different type of uh, reasons, there are the different type of criteria by which the peoples are being grouped. So the HEPS was uh, given this HEPS rule by this idea that the grouping is having with some common uh, criteria. And uh, by uh, concerning on that criteria, Hebs uh, uh, was able to giving the Hebian learning rule and which is unsupervised. That is according to the um, uh, particular uh, habit, particular uh, things which is very much common. So the pattern is being trained to that particular group. So the data which is common to the particular group are coming, uh, are coming from uh, that particular input group to the output uh, output as a uh, common group. So by giving the common example uh, of, uh, of common criteria, uh, it is unsupervised learning rule is being formed. Some are unsupervised as uh, reinforced. Reinforced are supervised as well as the unsupervised. In reinforced uh, learning type of the rules, uh, very common example is uh, when uh, uh, the students are being assembled in a prayer ground. After prayer ground, the students are uh, in a very uh, patterned row. Uh, they, they will enter into the classroom. For example, some students are being deviated from that row. Then the teacher is being uh, instructed to, uh, to give in the uh, to uh, go uh, for a particular row in the particular classroom. So when any teacher is, uh, is uh, being given the instructions to follow that particular row, then that following is reinforced. Yeah, the teacher is forcing to uh, adjust with that particular row and uh, avoid to just avoid the deviation of the students from that particular row to enter in the classroom. So that is the reinforced. That is also treated, treated as unsupervised here. So 
for an unsupervised learning rule, the training set consists of the input training patterns, training patterns, that training patterns may be the, by the grouping or by reinforcing. Therefore, the network is trained without the benefit of the teacher. The network learns to adopt the, uh, based on the experiences collected through the previous training pattern. Typical examples are the this Habian learning rule and the competitive learning rule. This is the biological neuron. In this biological neuron, this is nucleus cell body. Here, here it is the neural network, axon, synapses, dendrites, it is input, it is output, it is cell body. It is cell body here. Dendrites, all inputs are coming through dendrites. It is being processed in cell body threshold. If any neuron is having greater value than the threshold value, then it fires. When it fires, giving the output at the axon, and this from this axon, it it again uh, the signal is passes to, to to the another neuron. It is, uh, again, inputs, uh, neurons, output, teaching input, again being processed for this learning process. In mathematical terms, the neuron fires if and only if this, uh, uh, we have already discussed, this is the threshold value x1, x2, all are the inputs, w1, w2 are the this synaptic weights. In addition of the input weights and of the threshold makes, this neuron is very flexible and powerful one. The neuron has the ability to adopt to a particular situation by changing its weights or threshold. Various algorithm exist that cause the neurons to adopt. The most used ones are the delta rule and the back error propagation rule. The former is used in feed forward network and the later is feedback network. This is again network. Adaline network, that is the adoptive learning network. This adoptive learning network applications are pattern recognition. It is essentially a single layer back propagation network. It is trained on pattern recognition tasks where the aim is to classify the bit map, map representation of the digits zero to nine into the corresponding classes. So it is not necessary uh, that in the bit map mapping representation, always the networks are being uh, single layer, maybe the multi-layer also, where the aim is being, is to classify the bit back representation of the digits zero to nine into the corresponding classes. Due to the limited capabilities, the network only recognizing the exact training patterns. When the application is ported into the multi-layer back propagation network, a remarkable degree of the fault tolerance can be achieved. In your pattern recognition, Pattern recognition means whether it is the character recognition, it is the phrase recognition, it is the uh, sign recognition. All recognition is being again supervised type of the learning where we have a set of pattern 
and again we are comparing that set of pattern with our our pattern which we have to be to detect we take the data we take the bit mapping from the from our inputs train the network and get the train network then operate on the yield data when we uh, we have the train network and process it for the yield data then we can recognize whether it is similar to what other patterns it is also same pattern with the classification through the an conclusion the computing world has a lot to gain from the neural networks their ability to learn from learn by example makes them very flexible and powerful furthermore there is no need to devise an algorithm in order to perform a specific task that is there is no need to understand the internal mathematic internal mechanism of that that task they are also very well suited for the real time system because of their fast response and computational time which are due to their parallel architecture this artificial neural network as we have discussed are completely based on our data our input which we have when we have a large amount of data uh, uh, particular chain of the data set of data by which we train the our network in the same way our machine uh, learning machine learning is also the gift of artificial intelligence in in machine learning it is also based on the system where that system uh, learn that learn from the data so but it is again different there is a very uh, large difference between the data mining and uh, your machine learning data mining is uh, uh, another thing uh, in which there are the different methods by which we extract the data uh, by which we extract the data within the streams uh, that is the uh, that is the basic criteria of the data and so it is different uh, very different from the data mining as well as uh, other big data processing so machine learning is again gift of artificial uh, intelligence from where we can make any decisions pattern recognition decision making all these things without the human interventions now there is open to ask any question open session now hello हेलो सर हेलो हेलो हाँ एनी क्वेश्चन रिगार्डिंग एन एन और इज देयर एनी क्वेश्चन इज देयर एनी क्वेश्चन any question regarding machine language and other any question one hands is raising 
and then in machine learning regarding nn machine learning other related topic of the artificial intelligence this nn uh, as you know that it is a component of the soft computing soft computing is having five components fuzzy logic artificial neural network genetic algorithm probabilistic reasoning chaos theory so nn is uh, very good uh, component of the soft computing sir sir actually we have not given the unmute right to participant so they will ask question from the chat box through okay. chat box okay then uh, then uh, i am finishing my uh, this lecture oh. yes sir so thank you uh, sir thank you very much for wonderful lecture or uh, you have covered everything all aspects of uh, artificial neural network and related to all the uh, area of this artificial neural network so wonderful lecture sir thank you very much i hope participant has enjoyed this lecture so thank you once again sir thank you sir thank you welcome to all now we have another expert of this uh, fdp mr siddharth madhav so i am connecting siddharth within a minute siddharth siddharth i have given you the right of co host thank you uh, so so i welcome siddharth madhav siddharth madhav is a dreamer innovator and experimental learner based out in dehradun with a penchant of for hands on experiment he believes in education that is practical flexible and challenging siddharth has conducted workshops at various colleges including oh, wow. senior institutions like lal bahadur shastri national academy on present day technologies like the internet of things he is a young man with a heart for science technology engineering environment and love for animal so i welcome you to start in this fdp over to siddharth hello yeah thank you uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, good morning good afternoon everyone and uh, so today we will be like uh, discussing about uh, internet of things and internet of things we will be also applying basics of you know and along along with internet of things we will be discussing uh, basics of like uh, how we can implement machine learning and we will be also visualizing like how machine learning can work with sensors data and how we can perform tasks like analytics and visualization along with it okay so first of all uh, uh, now coming to the point 
Internet of things, basically, when I say the word Internet of things, so Internet of things means that basically I have some objects around me and like I have some like I have a plant with me and like I want to water that plant because uh, I'm like I'm going to office uh, in the morning. I'm coming back at night and I have like 10, 20 plants at my home and like I want a regulated uh, watering system for them. Like they get water on time and everything is like perfect with them. So what I want is that whenever I go to office, so every two hours they should get right amount of water. So now how will they will get it? So here comes the concept of Internet of Things. So in Internet of Things, uh, how I'll implement in this is like, for example, if I take the example, sorry. For example, if this is my plant, okay. So this, for example, I have a plant like this. And along with it, I have a sensor embedded. Now that sensor basically will detect the moisture. Like suppose if uh, we can, uh, now here comes a very like uh, important function. Like you can also connect it with uh, either ANN or some uh, activation function that we use in ANN. And, uh, so we use the heavy side uh, step uh, function in the activation function we use in neural networks. So what happens is, in what in that algorithm, what happens is like suppose that, uh, that is used in decision making. Like it works with zero and one. So you have a particular threshold value, and if the function like if the summation of all the weights of the inputs, like you have some inputs in a neural network, and if the summation of the weights of the inputs goes above the threshold, then obviously your uh, one condition will your one condition will execute, and if it is below the threshold then your zero will execute so basically this is used in decision making so you can just have a basic correlation idea with it like not directly uh, implementable but a basic correlation can happen with it so now coming to the diagrammatic part so for example if i have this plant okay so i'll just label it as a plant so i'll label it as a plant and along with it i have a small sensor embedded so I'm embedding the sensor and I'll just label it like this as a sensor. Okay. So what the sensor is doing, it is sensing the moisture and it works on zero and one only. Like if the value of the sensor is one, then the water supply will start. And if the value is zero, then the water supply will be cut automatically. So this is my sensor, for example, and I have connected the sensor to a plant to the soil I have connected. And next thing, what I want to do is I want to the like I want the my plant to get water at the right moment of time when I'm in office. So I will take this water supply. So just coloring it up a bit. So I will take the water supply and I will just name it over here. So I'll take this water supply, I'll name it as water supply. And now I am connecting a relay. Now, what is the relay basically? Now, see, when we talk about IoT also, and we talk about this cloud and all this internet and all this data transfer and all this neural network, whether it be convolutional or artificial or recurrent, whatever. So one thing we have like all these things, the, the base of all these things is the basics, physics, chemistry, like not exactly like, I'm not saying it's directly applicable, but the base of it is indirectly or directly connected to all the three subjects. The physics, chemistry, math that we study in 11th and 12th grade. So like this is my water supply. So I will have a small relay. So what a relay does is it auto cuts the current based like this will be a digital relay. So this will auto cut the current based on what my controller or what my sensor sends the data and by this plant. Okay. So like this is my relay. So I'll just give it a name. A relay. So this will be my relay. And of course I will have to connect it to the mains so that I get a good power supply and I have just connected to the mains. For example, this is my connection. I have connected this to the mains and I'm getting the power supply for my entire device. And this, inside this water supply, now we also need a like motor and something like that, which will be used for supplying the water. So I'll have a small motor inside it. Small motor inside it I'll have. 
Now what this motor will do is I will connect this motor to the relay and my controller. So what it will do is the motor, the sensor will sense the signal and it will send that to the controller and then the controller will accordingly send the signal to the relay and the motor. So now just coming to that relay, I'll connect to the motor because just to give it a good power supply. So I have just connected it over here and then I have the most, then I have a good controller with me. This controller is known as the Arduino Uno. So Arduino Uno like is basically, it's just another printed 13, it's another printed circuit board. The actual name of the controller is at mega 328 p So it is just another controller. So what that controller does, it, it has some logic gates embedded in it and or whatever, like we supply some data and it does all the processing and all, and it gives us a desired output. So this is the controller we have. So I'll just label it as controller. So this is my controller and I'm giving it the name Arduino because it has an Arduino controller. Next, what I'll do is I'll just connect this to my sensor. And I'll connect this relay to my controller. So what is happening here is if we talk about uh, like if we talk about just the basics of this, like how it is working, I have this relay with me and I'm not like it's not a very complicated thing. And so I have this relay with me and I'll power this relay and what this relay is doing, it is sending power to all my sensors and my electronic parts will, will which will be used for, you know, maybe that communication or whatever, like communication and uh, processing and whatever part. Okay, so this relay has a power and this Arduino gets the power and everything gets the power. So now comes to the sensor. Now we come to the sensor. Now we'll just write a small logic. If the sensor value is equal to equal to say one, then in electronics or IoT, like we have this, uh, you know, this uh, commands, basic commands, and we'll just be knowing the keyword for that command. So it is digital, right? And then whatever name we have given to the sensor, I can say sensor. So this sensor, and then I will write it sensor, comma, I. So what my logic is basically doing is if it is, you know, uh, like that depends upon my logic. So, so I'm so sorry, it will be low. So what my sensor is doing is if I'm providing any value, like I have just given it a value as one. And if that value matches like value by value, I mean, so like the sensor, of course, if I insert it into the soil, it will pass a small amount of current into the soil and the pulse value will be returned back to it. And accordingly, the analog signal to digital signal conversion will happen but here what happens is i have provided i have already declared the sensor value if it is one then what will happen is the water supply will start okay and if the value is zero then the water supply will stop okay so this is how we'll work with it. Like this is how it works. So basically this is the main concept of the sensor. Now implementing other technologies into it. Like we'll just discuss one more example and then we will uh, know like how we can implement other technologies into it. Now coming to the other sensor. Now we have like all heard about, like we all have basically most of us have Alexa and Google Assistant at our homes and uh, we have all those smart lights which are like connected via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi and we can control it with Alexa and Google Assistant. So now just discussing the basic function of how that thing works. Like suppose if uh, I'm taking this example as this is my controller. Okay. This is my controller. Yeah, this is my controller and what I need to do is I need to just create a small system and I'll just draw the flowchart also that I just need to create a small system in which if I send a signal via my mobile 
uh, to any of my appliances. I'll, I'll not use like very complex techniques like, you know, just connect it to an Alexa and build the whole system from zero to, like, it's a, not a very difficult system. So, and we'll not control it via Alexa or something, we'll control it via a mobile with some third party application or even with our, you know, small uh, ready-made application that we have on a mobile, like message or call, whatever we have. Okay, so we have a controller and suppose if this is my plans one, I'll just color it. This is my plans one, this is my plans two, and this is my plans three. Okay, so I will just fill the color. These are my three appliances. Now, what I want is I will first now in whenever we work with electronics, we like with the mains, especially in this internet of things because whenever we talk of internet of things like even if i'm like teaching it to like if some junior like suppose if, uh, for example a third class student or a fifth class student any junior student who is very much interested in this technology he is just learning about internet of things and when i tell him if we can control things via mobile and we can send this signal we can make that we can make this the first thing which will come to his mind is the light because you know, generally most Alex and Google assistant ads come and they see movies like Iron Man and all in which Tony Stark's contain like controls his home via mobile and voice commands. And even Mark Zuckerberg has fully automated his home and like it's like everything is automated. So if he asks for a shirt, a shop shirt will just drop in. If he asks his assistant to make breakfast, the breakfast will be automatically made. So all these things they are integrated, like all these technologies are integrated. And then the basic part, so that's why, and since we are just talking about all this controlling and all these parts, so the basic part, which is like the most basic part we should cover first is this home automation thing. So like this, I have these three bulbs, okay. And these three bulbs, like I have connected it to you know my relay or my mains whatever i have connected like we connected to the relay and the mains only so i have connected it to the relay and the mains i'll just write it in a single term relay plus mains so i will connect it to the relay plus mains and what will happen is like it was power obviously everything and i'll have my controller so now basically when we like talk about now now coming to the controlling part when i talk about i want to like basically communicate or control my system or my automation with this so the first thing which will come to my mind is like okay like what can i like what type of communication will i use so i will use serial communication and we will obviously send serial signals which are zero and one because most of the things in computing even if we talk about what i just uh, said a uh, few moments back about that artificial func uh, like artificial neural network that activation function that threshold decision making that we have so basically everything we use zero and one so zero and one are very important in most of the technologies basically in every technology so i have this controller with me and i want to just like control it wires i want to control my home via serial signals so what i'll do is if we have a very small logic for it I'll just draw the flow chart. Yeah. So now what I'll do is, suppose if my logic starts from here, I have taken some inputs. So I've taken an input. I'm so sorry, I'll just write it in pure black color. Yes. Yeah, sorry. So now I'll take an input. So if I'm like controlling three lights, obviously I need to like declare the input first. And now when I declare the input, like uh, we use embedded C here in this case. So right now I'm just like, I'm just giving the basic analogy. So what we do is here, like when we, when I say take the input, I just say like this. You can just name it any, you can just name this bulb as bulb one, and you can just name this bulb, the second bulb as bulb two, and you can just name the third bulb as bulb three. So these are my three bulbs that I have inputted. Now what I need to do is like, since I've inputted these bulbs, okay, now they have been declared. 
so i will just uh, like in my controller i have some digital and i have like, in the every controller that we use for iot and internet of things and even for robotics or other technology we have some input pins and output pins so we will just declare them over here so i can declare bulb one as one pin only bulb two as two pin only and bulb three as three pin only okay we will just discuss the pin also ahead bulb three as three pin so i have declared these three inputs with me and now i just want to create a communication channel between the bulb and my mobile so what i'll do is there is now since it is a serial communication so we will just establishing a connection between that so bt stands for bluetooth so bt dot serial available and bt dot read so these are two lines like if, if you are working with bluetooth and internet of things so these are the two lines which will be used to establish a communication between the biggest project on earth to the smallest project on earth by your mobile if you are working with bluetooth okay these two lines only so like these are the two lines i have just established the communication channel and now what i'll do is since i've established the communication channel i'll just write a simple logic for it Okay, now the logic goes like this. Now we all know, like we all know, like we are all since many most of the people present here are from technical background. So one stands for on, I, on and high. So even if you talk about like logic gates and you know, I like if I talk about and gate, if any of the input is low and the output is low and then whatever logic gates and I talk about, I'll always talk like high, low, one or zero. Even in switches, we have that symbols one and zero if you talk about the small switches. So one stands for on and high and zero stands for low and off. Now what we will do with the logic is yes. we will of course we have taken all the inputs from the bulb okay and then we have written this code now these two lines are enough to make communication between your mobile and the biggest project on earth which is involving Bluetooth. so now i'll just write a simple if logic over here now that if logic goes like this if suppose if i have taken the variable now i also need a variable here you know which will which will act as a which will take in the input value and it will take in the input value and that it will send it to the controller okay so suppose if i take that variable as data so if data is equal to equal to one suppose if i am asking one okay so equal to equal to one then i will write variable right So what will happen in this case is like if i suppose i connect my mobile to this okay my mobile will get connected it will not be a very complex process you just need to like the many applications also available already like bluetooth control and iot bluetooth the many applications on play store available so if i connect it will get connected and then there are button configuration in which you just need to select that what data will be sent to the device so that is already available so that is not a very complex task this is all available in the apps and it is completely free and open source the data is equal to equal to one then bulb one comma high so that means if i send one signal via my mobile this bulb one will light up okay and if else if i just write another else over here data is equal to equal to zero then digital right so in this case if i'm sending a zero signal then bulb one will be low okay and similarly for this like since i've defined for one now this i have only defined for bulb one similarly for bulb two and bulb three you can give logic so what happens in these iot apps are you have a you have some buttons over here like i'll just show the diagram in a moment so like this we wrote for this bulb one similarly we can write for any other so i'll just remove this part and we will discuss how basically it can be controlled by the app
So now, the for example, yeah, this is my IoT, this is my mobile, for example, per se, and I have some buttons in it. Like I opened the app and I got the message on my app connected. I got the message on my app connected. Okay. And I now have a set of buttons along with me. So I have this one button, I have this two button, I have this three button, for example. And now what will happen is uh, there's an app on Play Store. It is BT control for Arduino, Bluetooth control for Arduino. It's available on Play Store. So what happens in it? You just need to connect your device. Okay. And what will happen is then you will get this message connected and then you will have these buttons. So there will be an option edit what data needs to be sent. And then you will take this, you, you know, just you can just write whatever. So if my first button is an apple, and then if second button, I want to send two data right over here. And for the third one, maybe I want to send zero. So it will be off. So this is how it works basically. Okay. And now coming like this was one small example, like these were two small examples, which we did. like one was of the water, uh, that soil uh, plant monitoring system and the plant watering system. And one of one was of this in which we control the home appliances. Okay. Now we'll just discuss one very great example. And you know, it fascinates, it fascinates, fascinates everyone. You, and like, especially if you talk about like, uh, you know, kids of say 12 or 13 years, like from that, from there, most IoT developers give, get inspiration because what happens is when you show an IoT project, like um, controlling a bulb or controlling a car or whatever, with a mobile or voice, then kids of that age only get fascinated a lot. And that fascination is only required to, you know, just innovate and develop more. Now discussing the most like most exciting and the most interesting example of all okay and i'm just i had told that i'll just discuss two but this is the most interesting example so i'll discuss three examples and then we'll move on to the next part so for example like i have drawn this table over here okay this is my truth table Now we'll be discussing how we can control, like how a full-fledged car is controlled. By car, I mean a car. <laughs> yeah. Now what happens is, now first I'll discuss the diagram of the controller. Okay. So this is how the controller looks like. This is how the controller looks like, and in this there are some components. I'll just draw them out. Yeah, I'll just draw those components up and so this is my USB cable in which I'll upload the programs which I just showed like the dummy program that i showed you those all programs will be uploaded via this cable and here will be my microcontroller and this microcontroller you know, is also known as at mega 328p and like we can customize it but uh, we like we can customize controllers but we also need to change the electronics along with it so this is my at mega 328p controller and then we have of course so one more important component over here is the 16 megahertz crystal oscillator. Now what a crystal oscillator does is usually like uh, even if you uh, open your like uh, suppose if uh, there are you know if you even if you open your Alexa if anybody is by chance having an Alexa at home and if you by chance happen to open an Alexa then there is a silver silver kind of resistor that is called a crystal oscillator. So what that crystal oscillator does is it you know controls all the timing functions like if i say that after if i say that bulb one will blink will be on for 10 seconds then there will be a delay of say 10 seconds so that delay function that all the time function they work with crystal oscillators 
and the basic frequency of it is 16 megahertz. Okay, so I have this crystal oscillator and the rest have all the electronics like resistor capacitor and those are like not now needed to be discussed. So this is my controller. Now if I want to like control a car, full-fledged car, so obviously I have I will have four wheels for car. So the first wheel I have here, here. The second wheel I will, I will have here, and the like third and the fourth wheel over here. So these are my four wheels for the car. So what I want to do is I want to control my car via Bluetooth via my mobile. So one thing what I'll do is I will just attach a Bluetooth module here, just a dummy one. Now how this thing works? Now there's something known as SIP protocol. So what that does is, uh, you know, we have the serial communication. And the two pins in any electronic device, if you see, they're very important for serial communication. And those pins are known as the TX pin and the RX pin. So what are TX and RX stand for? It stands for transmitter and RX stands for receiver. So basically one TX sends the data, serial data, whatever data we are sending, and one TX receives the data. And it works for both software and hardware simultaneously. Okay, so now this is my TX and my RX. Okay, and then I have connected all the motors. And now I have given a small logic. First, I inputted all these motors. So in my truth table, I will write like, Yeah. So I will write here motor one. Motor one, and in the second column I write motor two. The third column I write motor three, and the fourth column I write motor four. So motor one, motor two, motor three, and motor four I have. Okay. So suppose if I have taken the three inputs and the three motors, the wheels are connected, obviously. Okay. And then I have these motor one, motor two, motor three, and motor four. Now this one, then I have, I have with me also. This is the car. Okay. So this is my first motor. This is my second motor. And this is my third motor. And this is my fourth motor. Okay. And then we have this Bluetooth module. This is known as the HC05 Bluetooth module. Okay. And like there are many types, there are six also and many other types of Bluetooth modules available in the market. Uh, just a moment, please. Yeah, thank you very much. So this is my car and I have shown you the wheels. Now, if you see the front circuit, okay. So this blue, blue thing, if you see over here, like I'll just show this blue, blue thing that you see over here, it is known as the Arduino Uno, which has a silver kind of USB cable, like USB port. So what that Arduino Uno does is that is the heart or the control system for this car. Okay. And this red red thing that you see over here is with this black color top is known as the motor driver. So motor driver contains a heat sink, heat sink basically for sinking the extra heat. And it also contains a voltage regulator, which will, you know, convert like whatever input voltage we have, it will convert it into the required output voltage, which is five volt. So this is the car basically. Now, if you want to see the working of this car, okay, now which will be demonstrated right now, in fact. So if suppose I have a logic, like for motor one, if I say that, if motor one is one, like one means forward. If I say, suppose if I send a one signal and not even one, I'll just write F. So F is signed for forward. So if I send forward signals, then all the values of motor one, motor two, motor three, motor four will be one. That means all the motors will be high. If I send two value, then the motor will go back. And how it will go back? See, what happens is if I connect thing connection serially, now in serial connection, what will happen is if I connect negative and negative, positive and positive, it will move in one direction. And if I connect oppositely, then it will go in the opposite direction. So I will just connect oppositely, and then I will write a logic. Like if my signal I'm sending, it is B. 
that means back by a mobile then what will happen is these motor 3 and motor 4 will rotate reverse and if i said f all the motors will rotate together okay now next thing if i send a signal suppose l you know i'll just send a signal l signal l i'm sending so in l signal what will happen is these two motors on the right hand side on the left hand side will only rotate so if these two motors only rotate so these two motors will be high and these two motors will be low getting the logic right because these two motors are high so these so the car will move in the right direction like this and if these two motors are low these two motors will be still so basically it will create a center point and from the center point the car will move left or right and similarly if i send a signal s so signal s that means all the wheels and will be low so when i say all the wheels will be low by that i mean that uh, the car will stop okay so now just a small demonstration of the car just give them So now uh, in this I'll not use a relay because I'm not connecting to, connecting into the mains directly. So this is my car. And I'll just connect it to my laptop to just power it because you need one, like you need to power the components also. Because the battery which I had installed in this one, it only powers the motors, but we need to like Internally, we need to power the controller also. So, just give me a moment to connect it to the controller. So, as you can see, this has started working. And if you carefully observe the blue, uh, see the Bluetooth module, you can see the red light blinking. That means it is ready to receive a signal. The TX is the TX pin, as I told, is transmitting a serial signal, and the RX. On my mobile, this is my mobile, and the RX on my mobile, it will receive a signal. And then the TX on my mobile, I'll send any value S, F, B, L, or R. And then the RX of this will receive it and add it to the program. So, for just giving a small uh, demo for the room, which I had told. So I'll just open the application and uh, this is the application which you know controls basically this car also and the room in which I'm sitting on. So as you can see all the lights have been turned off. Okay, like everything is off over here. And now if I just you know just press this button over here, so everything will be on. So basically I'm controlling my lights with this. So if I suppose if I press this button, one light off, and the first button stands for the fan, I just off this button, and the fan also off. And if I want to off, everything gets on. This technology will be like like currently there are a few billion devices in the world, and this technology will be great technology in the future also. So now just you have seen the demonstration of the room. So now I'll just show you the demonstration of the car. Uh, just a second, please. Yeah, thank you. So we'll just uh, see a demo of the car as well. So I'll just open the car and no, I'll just open the application and I'll just connect it. Just a moment, please. Give me a moment. So as you can see, this is the page. Okay, we have, and here will be an option, command button configuration. So here you can see button A, button B, and we just need to select the button and we just need to type in the data like this. So button A, here you can see button A, I have written here. So here there is an option coming, data to send to the Arduino. So I will just write here as F, as I told. And since this is a pre-programmed, like I had already programmed it, so it will work. So forward, backward, 
left So just a minute is just connecting to my car and you can see it has connected so now if i press the f button it is moving in this so the front direction is this this one so it is moving now if i press the back button it is moving so front it is going when i press the front button that means if i press the f button all the motors are in a high value okay and if i press the back button according to my electronics it is all the values are high, but they are traveling the opposite direction because they are because negative is connected to positive and positive to negative. If I type left, then you can see these side is rotating, and so it will twist to the right. And if I say left, then it will twist. And if I say stop, then all the motors will be low. So this is the basic application of Internet of Things and all the smart cars, all the smart sensors will be there in the future. So now just coming to the last part, the conclusion part, we are just describe a basic, uh, you know, how we can control, like how we can implement like uh, machine learning and all these uh, technologies in Internet of Things. So now we have something known as uh, linear regression in multiple variables. Like we have a linear regression in one variable also, and we have linear regression in multiple variables. Now implement, uh, implementing that to electronics. Now once again, I have my controller. Now I want, now what my controller will do is, it will sense the humidity and the temperature. So there will be two X1 and X2 variables. It will sense the humidity and the temperature, and then it will accordingly predict the values so this is my controller and you can see i've just attached my controller to this so i'll have my sensor dst so the temperature and humidity sensor in electronics is called the dst sensor and what how does that dst sensor work so basically if the resistance is low based on the input then that means the temperature is high if the resistance is high then the temperature is low so this is how it works so i have connected this humidity sensor so i'll just write here humidity humidity i will just write it here and this is my controller so this is my controller and what this is doing is basically it is just taking in two inputs Okay, it is taking in two inputs. It is taking X1 and it is taking the X2. So now what I want to do is like suppose if I get the humidity and temperature in this, like Suppose the value of x1 I am getting like suppose I get it as 12 or say not we are not talking about numbers also here. We'll just discuss with simple variables. Yeah. So now if the value is coming like uh, if the value is coming over here, such as a or not a c1 and uh, i'll extend this x line and we have the values coming as c2 and this more data will be provided c2 well i'll just edit the above option also and here i'm getting as so well d2 i'm getting and here also i'll edit as d1 so these are some of my inputs that i'm getting okay so now how i will control it so if we talk about multiple variables regression so we have a equation that we can say i just one second just give me a moment please yeah 
So how we do it is let's make the brush out. So, so y so a. So we have a variable a and a we take as the intercept because what is happening? We have to predict the intercept and the predicted dot on whatever scatter plot graph we have, that will be our predicted value. So if you have a a and then the equation goes like a is equals to y bar minus b1 x1 bar. So x1 is basically our this x1 will, is our uh, coefficient for this b1. And how we calculate the b1 also, we will just go into that also. Because see, what we need to do is, we need to calculate this intercept and we will we'll be given a certain values and we need to accordingly find the average and then put the values over there. So it goes like b1 x1 bar minus b2 x2 bar. And since it's the first equation and we also need to find the value of this and this. Okay. And just imagine for now the value of y is given as uh, anything z1, z2, z3, z4. We need to find this and this. Now, since we need to find this and this, we will have another two equations. So now here what we write it. So here the equation will go by summation of the x2 square. Is the marker I cannot just a moment? Yeah, sorry, sorry, the marker was lost. Yeah, and then I'll write it as summation of x1, x2 into summation of x2, y into summation of x2, y. And in upon what we'll do is we will just write summation of x2 multiplied by the summation of x1 minus the summation of x1 square and since this is the equation for the b1 so like if you and in b2 what we'll do is like since b1 x1 we do x2 we have written so here suppose if i have written this b1 and here i've written this x1 and here i've written this 2 and here i've written this another 2 so what i'll do is in place of these x2 in b1 i'll write x like if it is b2 so in b2 all the x2 i'll replace by x1 and all the x1 i'll replace by x2 so this is how we will put all the values and then accordingly calculate our intercept because when we find x2 and when we find this b1 and b2 then we just need to put the values in this equation and all the values in this equation and when, then we'll get the desired output so and then one more thing uh, it is like these algorithms are like we have some very good tools that are microsoft azure iot and amazon web services so in microsoft azure iot we can directly implement that machine learning algorithm like this is just the basic i'm talking about so we can directly implement the prediction algorithm or the machine learning algorithm into our web server or our device whatever we are building an app uh, so thank you and that's all for today So, thank you Siddharthji for your uh, precious time, for giving uh, your precious time. The lecture was uh, excellent and the uh, participants are benefited with your uh, lecture. Uh, I, I think uh, this was a, uh, was a intellectual session.
which were totally on hands on so in online uh, mechanism in online manner such hands on training is uh, of key importance so uh, i think dear participants you have enjoyed this session thank you once again uh, siddharth sir for your valuable time and uh, now the time uh, allows us to go for lunch break uh, very soon we will meet at uh, 2:30 i think so uh, in the day 4 session 3 thank you very much and i have also shared the uh, attendance and feedback uh, link in your chat box once again i am sharing those uh, who are unable to to fill their attendance they mark their attendance right now or uh, the, the meeting is uh, uh, still on i am not going to disconnect you all you may remain with it day four session two uh, attendance from feedback form again shared those already filled not need to fill again so thank you very much thank you everyone we will meet at 230 sar thank you what data size uh, which uh, uh, which data site uh, size what is the definition of of large data size and small data size uh, you can answer this question like that uh, it is again subjective you can say that uh, the resources you are having with you in your uh, computing system okay the answer depends on that okay so uh, you will uh, means what uh, consider for now that uh, if it is a small data size you go with normal equation otherwise we have to go with this gradient descent okay so in most of the case in neural network uh, implementation the data set size is too big and that is why uh, it uses a gradient descent approach which is iterative optimization approach for neural network so we will be talking about gradient descent for regression right not neural network but i am just trying to relate uh, uh, this particular part with uh, earlier session of professor r k sivasu sir right so let us uh, okay so uh, the other type of regression is polynomial regression where we uh, call this regression uh, method more complex model it involves because it can also fit non linear data uh, we have Uh, in in some cases we have linear data in other cases we have non linear data so we cannot uh, use uh, linear regression for that data which is non linear we have to go with polynomial regression so here polynomial regression means what uh, uh, you you can say that uh, regression where degree of freedom is more right the linear regression is having degree 1 okay uh, uh, for example let's say x to the power 1 okay uh, the feature like x to the power 2 it is a quadratic right x to the power 3 okay cubic so similarly if you increase uh, degree or power of this feature okay uh, we are going towards polynomial regression so all these examples comes under the category of polynomial regression and the linear regression is having degree is equal to 1 okay so uh, so ultimately when we use polynomial regression it creates one problem if you if you take more degree of freedom ultimately it will create one problem and that problem we call it is known as over fitting problem in machine learning so the first problem is that in this session our objective is to find that how to detect this over fitting and if we find that our model is over fitting if we find a, uh, by using some method tools and techniques Uh, if we uh, detect that our model is overfitting that is the first thing that we want to do and the next thing how to overcome this overfitting okay so uh, there are different ways available to find that our model is overfitting or not okay we will discuss that and once we find that it is a uh, model is overfitting our data uh, we will try to uh, okay reduce that overfitting so regularization technique helps reducing overfitting okay so learning curves are the tool that detects overfitting exist or not okay so i hope this is clear to everyone uh, if you want to give your feedback with yes or no 
you can uh, give it give it to me uh, through chat box okay so yes i have to uh, i have one more hour okay left okay fine so i will try to wind up this session by 4:30 okay so uh, as i told uh, overfitting uh, detection with the help of tools and techniques we will be able to uh, detect overfitting and ultimately after detecting overfitting uh, we want to reduce effect of overfitting right so by constraining model parameters weight we can regularize our or reduce overfitting of our model okay so with the regularization technique in linear regression we will discuss okay uh, the other uh, regression techniques that is there but uh, there is not part of our discussion that is logistic and softmax regression this logistic regression uh, it is also very much popular while uh, uh, the, as a, as an activation function in neural network right so yes you can use it for uh, a regression also and in neural network also this is very helpful even softmax regression is also right so yes so what is the prerequisite if you want to implement these methods you need to understand uh, basic uh, okay details about algebra and calculus like vectors matrices uh, transpose operation dot product and matrix inversion right and uh, calculus partial derivative right so uh, we will uh, discuss that so uh, hands on uh, uh, session starts from here you just uh, have to first of all understand let's first of all go through the concept related to uh, machine learning regression techniques and then we will come to this implementation part right so just try and understand very basic and okay uh, uh, it will simply uh, okay clear all your basics uh, that why this linear regression how to implement it how to implement Uh, regularization technique for this linear regression so you can understand the data set very simple data set so you can consider it is a real data set right for example uh, i i will take only some uh, okay samples of this record uh, uh, data set so we have uh, three features you can say that from here to here the first feature is brand and model brand or model you can say that what is age of the car this is all about car right so this is a uh, car data set uh, for example if you want to predict uh, that what is the uh, second hand price of this particular car so we have some uh, values available with us like what is brand of this or model of this car right what is age of this car what is the mileage current mileage of this car and ultimately the price detail is also available with us so this we call label or targets okay targets and these all are features right maybe denoted by x1 x2 and x3 okay so assume brand and model uh, brand and age is same assume for example let's say maruti car and age is somewhere around 5 or 6 years right so car is for example maruti just for the sake of simply simplicity we want to ignore these two features okay so uh, consider this particular uh, data set and we will implement this thing okay uh, using linear regression uh, okay and without using uh, you can say that without using any library function so we will see uh, in a short while implementation detail of this okay so uh, linear regression uh, actually uh, if you if you want to understand linear regression uh, you know linear equation right so for example y is equal to mx plus c that is equation of a line okay and that is linear actually a line right so here if i replace this equation like this y is equal to right uh, instead of m if i write theta 1 x plus instead of c i write theta 0 okay so this is again equation of a line let me rearrange this equation a bit theta 0 okay before theta 1 x okay so my equation is something like this so this is an equation of a linear equation you can say that y is equal to theta 0 plus theta 1 x okay this is a linear equation okay so in in this equation there is only one feature just x okay one variable and here in this particular equation there is one variable okay uh, and that is gdp per capita so if you know gdp per capita 
okay of any country you will be able to predict life satisfaction of that country okay so for example assume we have some data available with us different countries and its gdp per capita and life satisfaction value is also given for 10 countries okay the name of the country gdp per capita and life satisfaction of that country okay for 10 countries it is given we can develop a model uh, it uh, we understand or we assume that our model is linear so we will be using linear regression for this and we will try to fit this data and this model when we fit this model and uh, it will give us two values of right this thing that is theta 0 and theta 1 so these two things are model parameters right so ultimately when you input as i told when you input data and if you input rules okay so it uh, sorry if you, if you input uh, data and if you input answers right answers means what here it is target value or label right so target or labels so in in this case particular life satisfaction value are targets and labels and data is uh, name uh, gdp per capita right your data is gdp per capita and answers are also given so here you will find value of theta 0 and theta 1 that is your model parameters okay so that is output of machine learning algorithm model parameters value so if you know model parameters okay for any country for example let's say india if you know gdp per capita these two values are pre calculated using previous 10 values of countries right different uh, we have 10 countries and its gdp per capita and life satisfaction value based on that we have calculated this theta 0 and theta 1 so now we know these two values theta 0 and theta 1 we now have a question that india is country and gdp per capita is let's say 1200 dollar right and if we input this 1200 dollar uh, as an input we know theta 1 and theta 0 so it will calculate life satisfaction value so this will become our linear model okay so this is very simple linear model but if you want to uh, uh, here we have only one feature like gdp per capita but for example in general when you have more number of features like gdp per capita uh, capita in in previous case we have three features like uh, brand age and mileage so that is x1 x2 and x3 right this is x1 this is x2 and this is x3 assume so our model will become like this theta 0 theta 1 x1 plus theta 2 x2 and plus theta 3 x3 for this particular example right so this is a weight okay or model parameter that this is weight of this particular feature that how much weight you want to give to this x1 how much weight you want to give to age and how much weight you want to give to the mileage okay so based on that and this is we call intercept okay we will discuss this this is intercept term right so theta 0 and here you can imagine x0 just for the sake of uh, okay uh, uniformity x0 right and you can assume x0 is equal to 1 okay it is always 1 so uh, if you keep x0 is equal to 1 it will become theta 0 okay so i am just trying to create basis for implementation detail okay so if you if you want to simply convert this equation okay uh, let us let me vectorize this particular thing right agar isko apan vector form mein convert karenge so how it will look like so you can uh, simply uh, take theta okay as vector and you can simply write this like this right theta 0 to theta 3 for this particular equation and x right like this x0 x1 x2 and x3 right so if you want to calculate y what you can do you know uh, you can simply uh, calculate theta transpose x right so this is dot product we can say that and just for the uh, getting our dimensions right i have converted theta to transpose right so getting our dimensions right if you want to perform matrix multiplications you have to get dimensions right for the both of the matrix okay for example there is one matrix let's say theta and there is another matrix let's say t okay or let's say x not t x right so number of uh, okay uh, columns in this particular matrix and number of rows in uh, particular matrix they should match right that is why uh, you have to get your dimensions right for matrix and 
this is vectorized uh, okay representation of this particular equation so either you write this equation linear regression uh, sorry linear equation or if you write this vectorized equation both are same so if you know values of theta and if you know this you will be able to get y and y is nothing but our target value for this case y is price of car second hand car for example this is given and this is also given for example if i now want to predict once our model is trained mujhe a predict karna hai i want to predict that mileage is 15 so what is the price of this particular car with mileage is equal to 15 okay so uh, age and brand is also given for example so you will predict somewhere here so this is ultimately uh, the way we can implement this particular model we'll see in a short while okay so okay let me open a notebook first of all and we will see this right so let me open it so without wasting time uh, okay uh, yes i have uh, prepared one okay uh, i hope this is visible to everyone uh is this notebook visible yes yes i will i will surely cover overfitting in detail okay so this uh, notebook is visible to everyone thank you for response uh, so see uh, as i told i will only uh, okay consider for the sake of simplicity one feature that is mileage and this is our target right so this is you can consider x and this is your y right we represent data set as capital x and okay i am following a convention of one book i will give you detail of that particular book later so capital x is your data set and this is your target set okay so uh, this is your data set and this is your target set so target is actually your okay output your answers your labels okay we call it target set okay so yes so <clears throat> now let's understand uh, if you want to uh, right implement it by your own okay and if you want to implement using sklearn library you just need to see uh, we will be using uh, numpy here and uh, matplotlib for plotting right and sklearn also right so in in some cases you may require pandas library for data set if it is available there in Maybe a document file. Okay, so you'll be able to do that with the help of pandas. So, uh, uh, if you run this particular uh, cell, it will import all the libraries. And I have simply uh, see this data set. It is in uh, okay, very well organized form in visible form. You'll be able to okay understand this data. But when you load this data into NumPy, okay, on NumPy array, it will be like this. Okay. so if if you see this data let me reduce size of this so you will understand now see this okay as you can see the first row of my data set okay is like this that is 10 2.57 second row is 12 2.93 similarly 14 3.35 and so on right so how many uh, rows are there there are six rows so i have loaded this matrix okay and name of this matrix let me okay so name of this uh, numpy array is data okay name of the numpy array is data so if i print this data it will look like this okay so it is a numpy array right so this is the way my data set looks like in okay python environment you can say that i am using right now google colab so this is uh, my data set in python environment this is my feature column and this is my label column target column right so yes it is six rows and two columns for now okay just to make it simple this is uh, matplotlib i am importing right now let's try to plot this data okay if you run this cell okay you will see this output so data uh, on x axis there is a mileage on y axis there is a price okay if i plot this data so you will see dots like this do you see any trend here right so plotting tool sometimes help you decide uh, uh, right uh, the model if if uh, do you see any trend if, if you want to give response to 
chat box please give me response do you see any trend here what type of trend you can see here in this particular plot it is linear or non linear yes good so by looking into this see uh, it is very obvious right now uh, it will not be as simple as right now it looks uh, in in case of some data uh, this data is very much linear and that is why i am just trying to help you explain that uh, plotting tools also help you decide which model to go for right so uh, uh, if you if you plot your data points and you'll be able to see yes uh, this particular points are a bit linear okay so i can go with a linear model okay if this data is not linear if it is not if you are not able to find any linear trend so you'll be able to uh, understand you yeah, know it is not linear so i have to go with non linear methods maybe non linear regression and that is polynomial regression right you have to first of all decide that you want to go with regression or not and if it is regression under regression either linear or non linear so in non linear case it is polynomial regression so under polynomial regression again there is a question which degree of polynomial you want to go with okay so uh, uh, this is the way you can find a linear or non linear trend okay so we will decide here that yes we want to go with a linear regression with this particular diagram so yes we see trend okay and if we uh, draw this trend we can simply find a line straight line so this is the line i have drawn using matplotlib so you will see uh, the linear trend okay so uh, but here what is the problem you know again uh, uh, this uh, okay here the axis x axis is starting from x 10 and y is starting from 2.5 so let us extend this limits of x and y axis and let us see that how this line looks look likes with origin 0 0 okay so yes it looks like this so by execute ex execution of this particular code you will see this i have just changed uh, okay these two lines i have added these two lines that i have uh okay change limits of x axis and y axis otherwise code is very similar to the previous cell okay so as you can see uh i have extended the limits that's it otherwise the previous uh, diagram and this plot is same okay so now the origin is 0 0 so if you extend now this particular line okay this particular line like this uh it is not pure okay linear uh, not straight line but it will help you understand if you extend this particular line here okay so it will intercept somewhere here maybe somewhere here okay so the value of interception is for example let's say it is point uh, 7 or 6 or something so this is intercept of this particular line on y axis okay maybe on positive side or maybe sometimes on negative side so that is intercept value okay so this will help you understand the model parameter also so if if you if you extend this particular line okay you will find the intercept okay <coughs> okay so now let us import sk learns linear model i am using library here for the first time and i am using linear regression model okay just to okay uh, train my model okay so this is my data you know we have prepared a data like this we have prepared a data like this okay this is data numpy array and when i print this data numpy array it contains two column the first column is actually the value of mileage and second column is target okay so this is capital x and this is small y okay so we are first of all sep we have to separate this data okay into x and y x is your data set okay or feature set you can say that and y is your target so let us first of all separate them out so this is the way uh, to separate them out this is slicing operation i am using okay on numpy array so x will become okay this as you can see right this it becomes this and this is a way to separate y again slicing and y will look like this okay so i have separated them out okay so sometimes you need to perform if two uh, arrays are not different they are not separated you can separate them out with the help of slicing operation okay 
uh, and uh, there is a uh, we are right now using sk learns linear model okay so in sk learn if you are not aware about it let me tell you let me briefly uh, explain you two functions uh, the first function is fit function and the other function is predict function okay this fit function of sk learn will help you train your model either linear regression model or non linear regression model support vector machine beat up, okay decision tree so this fit function will help you uh, you will be using one object like model dot fit and if this model object if this model object is of type linear regression right uh, you you create this model object in your python environment and this model object is of uh, for example linear regression for example okay uh, it is object of linear regression class and if you call this fit function over this model object which is object of linear regression class it will train linear regression model and you have to pass x comma y here okay capital x is your uh, feature set and small y is your label so this x can be any dimension like uh, uh, m cross n okay it can be uh, even three dimension also but for now we have only one column right uh, in x and one column in y so number of rows are there and there is there is only one feature in x so we pass this training data and training label we call it and model will be trained which model will be trained so linear regression model will be trained and after training it will simply learn model parameters value and what is model parameters value for this for this there are two model parameters theta 0 and theta 1 why only two because our equation is something like this theta 0 and theta 1 okay and x1 and equation is something like this this x1 is mileage if you remember we have only one feature if we have a brand value as a feature so we will have okay value a name of brand right so we will be having second feature so in that case we will have third model parameter but right now we have only two model parameters theta 0 and theta 1 so theta theta 1 is actually coefficient of x1 that is your first feature and theta 0 is we call it imaginary uh, okay features coefficient and that is x0 this is we call intercept right so uh, once you train your model linear regression model with this particular function okay it will find optimum value of theta 0 and theta 1 so that is model parameters right so once you execute okay once you execute this this particular line of code okay it will train your model okay and ultimately it will find value of theta 0 this is value of theta 0 and this is value of theta 1 right this is value of theta 1 so what this value of theta 0 is so let us understand it graphically again let's go back to the previous diagram if you extend this line a bit as i told okay and you have to extend this line a bit and you have to extend this line right like this uh, okay and it intersects somewhere on y-axis so the value of y-axis where it intersects that is the value of theta zero and that is actually intercept okay so your linear regression model of sklearn will find this intercept value and the second value that is okay uh, coefficient of x1 that is theta one right so these two values it will find and this is somewhere six zero point six or something right so if you train your model and if you find uh, if you look into the values of uh, theta zero and theta one you will see these two values right these two values so we have used uh, sklearn library okay to find the value of theta zero and theta one our objective of machine learning algorithm that is linear regression algorithm objective of linear regression algorithm is to find value of this theta 0 theta 1 theta 2 up to maybe theta n okay and we call this all these model parameters right so our objective of regression problem is to find values of model parameters 
And for this particular case, we have only one feature like mileage, we will have two model parameters value. If you have three features, you will have four model parameters value. Theta zero is okay. That is imaginary. You can say that model parameter and that is we call intercept. So please understand this. Okay. And we have used till now SKLN library. Okay. So now let's say uh, we here, let me note it out. Uh, this is somewhere around 0.6, right? So theta zero value is somewhere around 0.6 and theta one's value is, as you can see, uh, 0.20, let's say 0.2. Okay, just round off. I'm just trying to round it off. So for example, uh, we have some uh, values of cars like 10 miles, 12 miles, 14 miles, 16 miles, 18 miles and different values, right? We have price of the car with mileage 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. But now we have a car, okay? And the mileage of that car is 15 kilometer, for example, assume. And we want to predict that what will be the price of this car. I want to sell this car and I want to predict. I have model uh, available with me. So model available with me, that means what? I have model parameters value calculate, calculated, pre-calculated. So what I will do, my equation for Y is equal to theta zero, theta one, x one, right? And this is nothing but 15 is nothing but value of x one. Okay. And theta zero is already pre-calculated. That is 0.6. So let's keep 0.6 here. What is theta one? It is 0.2. And we will multiply it with 15. And that will give us price of the car, which is having mileage is equal to 15. Okay. So that is price of the car that we want to predict. And that is why. So the value will be, okay, somewhere around, uh, this is three plus 0.6. So my price car, uh, okay, price of the car where uh, mileage is 15, it is 3.6 lakhs or something, okay? So this is the way we can use this model. I am just trying to explain you, okay, uh, the basics that how it works and what exactly the machine learning algorithm learns. So in case of linear regression, it learns value of model parameter. So that is learning out of uh, this re linear regression algorithm. So what it learns, it learns model parameter values. Once it is, uh, once model parameter values are learned, it knows uh, model parameter value. Now you give it a new, new value of feature, it will calculate uh, answer for you. It will calculate label or target for you, okay? So that is how this uh, linear regression or polynomial regression model works. Okay, so as I told, if, if you find the value of uh, 15, mileage 15, right? So uh, uh, it, it is somewhere around 3.6, as I told. So here it exactly calculates 3.54 lakh rupees, right? And it falls somewhere here. It falls somewhere here, blue color, right? So the value uh, mileage of your car, if you project this line here, so it is 15 somewhere here. And if you project on Y axis, Okay, it will be somewhere here that is 3.6 or something. Okay, so this is kind of projection because you know now uh, value of theta zero and theta one. So with the help of sklearn, I have predicted the value, right? Uh, okay, so uh, there is one more example here. The data is very much linear. You can create your fake data set. So I have created fake data set using these two functions. So my data, if I plot this data set, it looks like this. So if, if I draw, uh, I, I can see, yes, that is a linear trend, right? It is a linear trend, yes. So linear regression will work. But if I try to draw a line, straight line, my line will not be able to touch each and every point. But I will try to fit, I will try to, uh, I will try to draw a line, which actually try to, uh, okay, encomp encompass each and every point. But my line will not be able to touch each and every line uh, point, right? So see this too. So we call sometimes this is a noise, okay? And because of the noise, linear model will not be able to uh, generalize that much properly. So it will introduce some error, okay? So, and in real world, your data will be like this. It will be not as idle as this, okay? In, in this case, it will be not as, Id as idle as this. In, in real world scenario, okay, uh, your data will be uh, noisy, right? You will see uh, that is a linear trend, but uh, data will be noisy, okay? So similarly, uh, this is our data set, X, 
feature set X, there are 100 rows and one column, and this is our target values, right? And if I fit uh, with a linear regression model of sklearn, it will try to predict two values of, uh, okay, model parameters because we have only one feature. So it will predict theta one and theta zero, okay? So this is value of uh, theta zero and this is value of theta one, okay? So after getting these values, if you draw a line, you will see the line look like, look like this, right? Looks like this. So it will try to touch each and every okay uh, point, but not every point. So uh, SKLearn libraries linear regression function will help you get the proper model parameters value. Okay. So this is automated actually with the help of using library. But if you want to implement your own version, okay, let us try to implement that too. Okay, uh, so with the help of, let me now go back to the slides and let me explain some part. And then we will come back to this particular, okay, uh, collab notebook. So yes, we have 35 more minutes to go. So let me quickly, uh, okay, go through the things. Yes, so see, if you want to uh, check that how my regression performs, that uh, the regression model that you uh, train and you want to find a performance that how it performs right so yes with the help of uh, okay uh, error that what error it introduces your model is having okay with the help of that how accurate it is so with the help of that you'll be able to find your model is performing better or not but before going into detail of that uh, okay uh, matrices like matrix like uh, uh, okay, how you'll be able to find accuracy of your model before going into detail. Let's first of all understand what is performance measure. Okay, so uh, uh, here uh, in, in mainly for regression, uh, we use RMSE that is root mean square error as a performance measure most of the time. And the other performance measure uh, that is advisable according to literature, okay, is ME, but mostly we go with this. Okay, I, I will explain you. I will uh, simply, okay, discuss that when to go with RMSE. Okay, most of the time we will be, okay, uh, using RMSE, but in certain cases we may go with ME, that is mean absolute error, right? So, uh, linear regression equation is given already in above slides and I have already discussed it. So if you want to train a model, you want to develop your own model, right? Uh, so you want to understand uh, how it works. This linear regression model works. We used already the fit function, right? Fit function of uh, SQL and library. So how it works, this fit function works. I want to implement my own version of this fit function. So how you'll be able to implement it, okay? So you have to understand, uh, first of all, performance measure, which performance measure you will be using for your implementation. Okay, so as I told, RMSC is mostly used performance measure for regression problems. Okay, so <coughs> it is ultimately a root mean square error. And why we want to use this RMSC, okay, uh, we will discuss very soon. When there are more, as I told, when to go with MAE, so when there are more number of outliers, right? So in, in your data set, if there are more, outliers or outliers are present, okay, you can go with ME because RMSC is more sensitive to I, okay, outliers. So what you can do, if you still want to use RMSC as your performance measure, what you can do, you can detect outlier, you can remove those outliers from your data set. Most of the data points are like this and some of the data points are falling very, okay, apart. So we call them outliers. So what you can do, you can simply remove these outliers and you can consider only this data. So you can still go with RMSC, but if you want to use outliers, there are certain outliers available in your data set and uh, you want to use performance measure. You want to also use outliers in your data set. You do not want to discard them. So better you go with ME, okay? Because RMSC performance measure is more, senti it is more sensitive to outliers. Why it is so? Because of the mathematical equation, if you look into RMSC's equation, you will understand that, right? So let me take you to that uh, equation first of all, okay? So this is an equation of RMSC, okay? So what exactly this equation is, 
this is the value that is predicted. Let's call it Y cap. Okay. Y cap for particular data, particular sample denoted by I. And this is value of actual value of that sample. This is predicted value and this is actual value. And what is meaning of this? You know, this is the difference or you can say that uh, deviation actual, uh, this is actual value, right? And this is predicted value. So predicted minus actual is the deviation. And if you find the square of it, okay? So it, it, it gives you squared error. So RMSC is summation of squared error, okay? Over number of training examples. So what is M here? Number of training examples in your data set, right? So one from one to M for the first training example, what is the error, squared error? For second training example, what is the squared error? For third training example, what is the squared error? You add them all, right? And you divide them by M. So that gives you MSC, that is mean square error. And RMSC is root mean square error. So for the calculation of RMSC, we need MSC, okay? And why this function, why it is more sensitive to outliers because uh, if there is an outlier, the difference, the deviation will be high. And that high deviation is squared. So when you uh, squared any term, it will give more impact. So that is why we can say that uh, in case of outlier, the deviation will be high. And if you again squared it, okay, it will have more impact on MSC. That is why we call it, uh, it uh, MSC is more sensitive to outliers. So if you want to include outliers, go with MA in that case, that is mean absolute error, okay? And one more advantage of using this particular performance measure of RMSC, it is a squared function. And squared function, it is something like you can say that X square. And if you plot curve for this, okay, quadratic, it is quadratic ultimately, right? So the curve for this quadratic function or a squared function is like this. It is a bowel shaped curve, right? It is a bowel shaped curve. And it actually helps us a lot in gradient descent technique. Okay, we'll discuss that in a while, right? So yes, so this is a performance measure and it is mostly used performance measure in case of uh, regression problems. And this is equation for mean absolute error, okay? So you can have a look, I'm not going into detail of it. Okay, so yes. So ultimately, as I told, uh, there are two, ways to implement regression. The first way is to go with normal equation. It is a one-shot equation, as I told, right? Normal equation. And the equation is something like this. How to find calculation, how to find calcu uh, calculate value of theta. So this is an equation for the same, right? So this is normal equation. But when we cannot use this equation if data set is 2D. We, can, we will not be able to fit uh, this calculation in main memory. So that is why we, we have to go with another option. And that option is iterative optimization approach. And that iterative optimization as, approach is gradient descent approach, okay? So <coughs> it helps us finding normal equation also calculate or it gives us value, optimum value of theta, okay? Uh, optimum value of theta like theta zero, theta one and theta two and so on. Right, but size of data set is too big. So we cannot use normal equation in some case. Most of the cases you will not be able to use normal equation because most of the time data set size is too big. So mostly we use gradient descent approach. Okay, and this approach help us, okay, uh, calculate optimum value of theta. Okay, irrespective of what is size of the data set. Okay, but we have to use iterative approach. It is not one shot. You, If you write an equation and it finds you value, it is not like that. We have to iterate many times, maybe 100 times, maybe 500 times, 1000 times to find the optimum value of theta. Okay. And gradient descent approach, actually, it is something like uh, you, you want to find uh, optimum values of theta. Right. So <coughs> wait a minute, please. You, you want to find optimum value of theta, okay? 
so what value of theta will be optimum it is very difficult to find for example let me uh, explain you by diagram itself okay so how actually it works we will come back to this slide again but let me show you uh, with uh, diagram so you will be able to understand it better okay so uh, in case of regression problem we use cost function and this cost function is mostly rmsc function or msc function let's call it msc not rmsc msc that is mean square error so this mean square error is squared function ultimately some well, uh, equation here squared function and as i told if you plot this curve it looks like this a bowl shape curve like this right so it is a bowl shape curve so assume on x axis there is one there is theta value let's call it theta 1 okay and on y axis it is a cost right so what is objective of uh, uh, gradient descent method is to minimize this cost value is to minimize this cost value okay that is objective of gradient descent method so the rmse function curve is like this okay ultimately uh, mean square error what is objective of cost cost function is mean square error and ultimately your objective is to reduce value of msc if mean square error value is approaching to zero okay means what your model parameters values are okay accurate okay they are the value of model parameters is optimum you can say that so when you get where you get this model parameters value optimum or accurate or near optimum near accurate at the bottom of this particular bow okay so why so because if you if you project this the value of cost is minimum so ultimately our objective of this to uh we we start at any random point in this particular curve and ultimately we will descend towards minimum and that is why uh, we call it descent okay we will descend towards minimum and ultimately we use gradient actually and gradient is nothing but it is a partial derivative of this particular curve it is a derivative of this particular curve okay with respect to theta and that is gradient actually gradient is a slope okay Uh, so that is why this method is known as gradient descent method so if you if you draw uh, for example let us assume we do not know that what is value optimum value of theta 1 what is the correct value of theta 1 we do not know okay so that uh, for example let's say this is 0 this is 1 this is 2 this is 3 this is 4 this is 5 okay any any value of theta so this is okay theta values so from 0 to 10 we have the range okay for example so we we start with some theta value maybe randomly maybe on this side or this side so let's say our random guess of theta 1 is 1 value of theta 1 is 1 we initially guess theta 1 is 1 okay so in in gradient descent method it is ultimately a guided approach so otherwise what will happen uh, 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 the theta values from 1 to 10 having infinite number of values okay infinite infinite number of values so what you will do you will initially start with one okay and then you may directly jump to three you may directly jump to maybe seven maybe after checking uh, value of theta uh, one is equal to one you will go with three then you will go with seven again you will jump back to six you will jump back to maybe uh, four okay and so on you may jump back to maybe eight and so on you will try different different values you will try with trial and error method and you see that what is the value of cost with this theta with that theta with this theta or with that theta right so that will take more time and it is ultimately a blind search ultimately we need guided search and that is all about machine learning techniques and gradient descent is actually very simple yet effective technique it is a guided approach it helps you to find uh value optimum value of theta model parameters value okay in guided way so let us understand that 
if you if you start randomly at any point maybe at this point maybe at this point or maybe at this point so here theta value is 9.5 here theta value is for example 10 or if you start with theta value is equal to 1 okay so what uh, gradient descent method will do it will simply try to find gradient or slope at this particular point with respect to theta right it will try to find gradient or slope at this particular point with respect to theta and gradient actually help you decide and in, in which direction to move okay so it is ultimately will guide you towards descent always descent right if you start here so the slope you measure here it will tell you that you should go in this direction if you measure slope here it will uh, show you that you should go in this direction okay so this is why this method is known as gradient descent you first of all find the gradient that is slope at particular point with respect to theta uh, here it is theta one okay and why it is called partial derivative at one time we find a gradient with respect to theta one uh, at another time we find a gradient with respect to theta two we have many features so theta one theta two theta three up to maybe theta n so we have to find a gradient with respect to theta one theta two theta three theta four up to theta n and then we will decide in which direction to move okay so right now we have only one direction to move for example let's say north okay if you have multiple direction like north east west and south so we have four uh, different values like theta 2 theta 3 and theta 4 okay you are somewhere here maybe uh, standing on the hill and you decide that in which direction i have to move so uh, maybe in south direction or now north direction so you have to find the okay slope and it will guide you the slope will guide you in which direction to move and up to means what the step that you want to take how uh, okay large that step is so that helps you gradient descent method helps you find that thing okay so once you are here you find uh, the slope and you will jump here when you are here again you find the slope and then it will guide you how long how much uh, means what how large step you have to take and in which direction to take so slowly slowly you will ultimately uh, proceed towards bottom of this particular curve and that is the global minimum you can say that okay uh, minimum here is global minimum because the curve is okay like this bowl that is convex Okay, ultimately that is why uh, there is only one global minimum and when you reach to this minimum, okay, uh, the slope of your curve will become near to zero. So when your uh, slope or the gradient is reaching near to zero, uh, you will understand, your algorithm will understand, yes, we are approaching towards minimum. And ultimately when it is very much closer to zero, uh, the algorithm will stop and it will say, this is the optimum value of theta. So when you reach here, you, you uh, find the value of theta is something like this. It is, for example, five. So this is the way, uh, this is the, you can say that intuition behind this gradient descent approach. I hope this is clear to everyone. Uh, let me know through chat box, please. Okay, so, <clears throat> so for example, there is one more thing uh, you should know, uh, uh, okay, and most of you know, maybe if you are into machine learning area, so that is a learning rate, okay? So this learning rate actually, uh, it is a one hyper parameter. It is, no, it is not a model parameter. It is hyper parameter for these models, right? So it, it helps you how, means what large step you want to take. So if, if you want, if, you, if your learning rate is too small, Okay, uh, you will reach to minimum, but uh, your algorithm will iterate more number of times. And then ultimately you will reach to this, okay, uh, minimum. So you have to decide it uh, properly that uh, what should be the size or what should be the value of this learning rate. If you keep it too small, your, uh, okay, number of iteration it will take, okay, more number of iteration it will take. And if it is too large, right? So this problem it will create, uh, smaller number of uh, uh, small learning rate won't create a problem but here if your learning rate is too high okay it your algorithm will diverge you are here somewhere and your step is like monkey jumps right so it will it may uh, diverge from your okay curve and you will not be able to converge ultimately 
you will not be able to find optimum solution so that is the okay uh, problem with a large uh, learning rate okay sometimes if your curve is not like as i told rmse is having the proper curve so the cost function right the cost function that you use if it is like this convex function it is having like this and it is having the only one global minimum or minimum that is one local minimum one global minimum and that is ultimately the minimum but in case of a cost curve like this uh, okay uh, it will be very difficult to uh, find okay optimum solution if you start from here you will ultimately stop here and if you start from here you will uh, stop here because uh, uh, here there is a saturation you can say that the slope of the curve is zero okay so your algorithm may stop here so it is not global minimum it is not local minimum but it will stop here and this is local minimum this is global minimum so this is also not a solution so the cost function which is having okay a uh, bowl shape curve you can say that right so ultimately it will find a solution for example a logistic regression equation the equation for logistic regression is something like this y that is predicted value of y and log y that is actual value of y plus 1 minus predicted value of y into log of 1 minus actual value of y so this is equation cost function of logistic regression method and if you see this is the actually cost function in in case of linear regression the cost function is rmsc right but in case of logistic regression the cost function is different it is not rmsc it is this cost function why they use this cost function because for logistic regression if you if you draw a plot for this particular uh, term the plot will be like this right and if you draw plot for this particular term it will be like this and if you connect this to plots half plots like it will become ball shape curve right and ultimately uh, it will have one global minimum so that is why this uh, uh, regression is also preferred in neural networks because ultimately it is having one local uh, one uh, global minimum and one local minimum you can say that okay so uh, if your method is having ball shape curve cost function uh, it is very important for you otherwise uh, very difficult to okay converse uh, you will not uh, be able to sometime uh, find the proper solution of model parameters okay so this is uh, what is meaning of cost function okay uh, i have explained you cost function of regression and also in case of uh, logistic regression okay so you can understand what is importance of cost function uh, uh, when it can converge when it can diverge on where when it can uh, find proper solution if it is a proper ball shape kind of curve it will be able to find surely it will find a solution okay so yes so uh, here also in 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 case of gradient descent uh, uh, feature uh, importance of feature scaling right it is there agar aap feature ko scale karte hain and if you are not scaling your feature okay uh, yes obviously it will uh, converge but it will take more time so feature scaling is important you should bring all these features for example age of a car okay mileage of a car and brand of a car so uh, this this range of values are different in uh, every feature so better you scale them okay normalize them in a single scale on a single scale and then train your model and surely it will find proper value of uh, parameters in lesser amount of time so this is a way to optimize it in in some models feature scaling is important in some models it is not required okay so um, uh, if, if you want to use gradient descent method okay better you scale your features and then you train your model so it will train it your model will be get trained in smaller amount of time so this are the you can say that in in some machine learning algorithm scaling is very important right so as you can see uh, if if you scale your feature it will directly approach towards solution right and if it is not scaled it will take more number of iterations right so it will take longer path so that is importance of feature scaling okay so yeah <clears throat> uh, as i told uh, we discuss only one uh, parameter like theta 1 but for example in real world scenario number of parameters are there like mileage age brand of a car there are three parameters in that particular example in in some cases we have 300 uh, features so we have theta 1 theta 2 theta 3 so up to th theta 300 so it is 300 dimensional space 
and searching optimal parameters in a 300 dimensional space is it is a herculean task you can say that it is like finding a needle in a haystack right 300 dimensional haystack so it is very a uh, trickier task okay then one dimension two dimension or three dimension 300 dimension uh, out of uh, 300 dimension you want to find optimum values of model parameters okay so gradient descent will help you find uh, in a guided way uh, okay uh, in a guided way uh, that you'll be able to find every value of model parameters from theta 1 to theta 100 uh, 300 in an optimum way in okay shorter amount of time so that is why guided way is required otherwise you will find different combinations of values from theta 1 to theta 300 and it will take maybe infinite amount of time okay so we need a guided way and that is gradient descent method that is importance of gradient descent method it is a generic method it is okay we apply this method even in neural network deep learning implementation also okay so now let's try to understand how we can derive uh, okay uh, how we can implement this method uh, uh, if you if you do not want to use uh, inbuilt method of sklearn how you'll be able to implement it okay so i have limited amount of time okay i was told to uh, go uh, okay till 5 pm but uh, we have 10 minutes left so let me uh, okay rapidly conclude this particular session so see the msc function uh, as I told, the cost function, okay, cost function for regression is this particular function. Let me uh, show you the equation uh, of this, uh, right, equation the, uh, of MSC. MSC equation is something like this, okay. Okay, let me write this equation here. Okay, so MSC equation, that is mean square error equation is something like this. It is 1 upon M. 1 to m and the value of predicted value of particular sample minus actual value of that sample and that is denoted by y i square and i 1 to m is actually number of samples first sample then second sample then third sample so i is particular sample and this is a squared right so this is msc so in uh, as you know as i told uh, the cost curve of msc is something like this right and this is theta you can imagine theta i and this is value of cost and you can imagine this is msc okay so this is curve of this particular function okay so uh, as i told you want to find okay slope of this function at particular point this curve at particular point okay so with respect to theta i okay with respect to theta i i want to find slope at this particular point okay and that slope equation of slope uh, in in uh, uh, okay uh, you can say that it is the first derivative what is slope it is first derivative of particular function with respect to some parameter theta i so if we find if we find derivative of this particular msc function which is this if i find derivative of this function with respect to theta maybe j or i whatever it is okay if i find derivative of this msc okay with respect to theta j it will become slope of this particular curve with respect to theta i so this is an equation of the slope okay so i'm not going into detail uh, how it has been derived I can explain that, but uh, because of the limitation of time, this is derivative of MSC function. You can say that. Okay. If you if you want to vectorize this equation, okay. Let me now vectorize this equation. Uh, if you want to implement this in Python programming, so what is how you can write this equation? You can simply write two into m multiplied by x transpose. Sorry. x theta minus y right so this is an equation of gradient you can say that this is the way to calculate gradient in python environment so what is x you know right what is the value of theta initially we will guess random values of theta right random values of theta as we 
uh, okay as i explained in the di diagram you can randomly initially guess random values of theta and ultimately uh, you know x you know y and if you know x you will be able to find xt okay and here uh, if you have noticed we are not using inverse operation this is the costliest uh, costliest operation uh, in matrix uh, matrix inversion is the costliest operation so in the calculation of normal equation we use inverse right here it eliminates that operation and that is why it is less computationally complex operation instead of calculation of that normal equation if we go with uh, this gradient calculation it is less complex so this is the a way we can implement gradient calculation in our method once gradient is calculated okay so what we can do next is you know let me so this is an equation for the same as i told okay jo maine abhi explain kara it is here so let me quickly move to the next slide so once you calculate the gradient what you can do you know our next objective is to this is value of gradient you know this is gradient let's call it a gradient okay so initially we start with theta random value of theta okay so let's say theta cap that is initial guess theta is equal to okay theta minus eta into gradient so this is an this is a learning step we can call we can call it eta is a learning rate the value of eta you can set any like 0.0 0.01 or 0.03 you can set this this is a learning step as i told if the learning step is too large it can converge if learning step step is too small it will take more number of steps okay remember and this gradient is calculated right as i told previously so gradient calculation we multiply this value point 1 with this gradient okay and we subtract this term from the old value of theta and it calculates new value of theta okay again uh, using this new value of theta okay again we calculate gradient and again gradient is calculated and the uh, the new value of theta we subtract from the new value of gradient and then again we calculate new value of theta so this steps will keeps on repeating okay and ultimately after certain number of iterations you will see the cost function is getting a value near to zero when it gets there you stop this number of iterations and ultimately you will find optimum value of theta okay so this is the way this particular method works okay so yes uh, five more minutes so let me bring you to that particular part okay uh, implementation one okay so here okay so ultimately uh, uh, this is the way to implement this gradient descent algorithm but before going into detail of that let me first of all as i told this is all uh, uh, we want to identify that overfitting is there or not and someone asked me question so let me take 5 10 more minutes okay and i will be able to conclude this so ultimately once you train your uh, model okay uh, what you do you know uh, uh, the code is there okay i'll not be able to explain this particular part but let me uh conclude with this particular okay output so once you train your model what do you do you know uh, if you want to find that model is overfitting or not or if it is underfitting or not so uh, there are ways out so with the help of learning curves okay with the help of learning curves you will be able to do that but the first way uh, first way to find that uh, model is underfitting or overfitting what you can do for example you divide your data into two parts as you know that training set and testing set right so if your model performs better during training but it is not performing better during testing your model is overfitting this is the first thing second thing your model is not performing better in performing better in testing training and not good in testing so it is overfitting but it is not performing better in training not in testing it is underfitting this is first way out uh first way that uh, uh, to uh, decide that it is overfitting or underfitting but if you want to find 
if you are not able to get this answer with this thing the first explanation you can find you can draw learning curves like this okay so with training data size uh, on x axis there is a training data and here it is rmsc that is your mean square error post value okay so you initially take your training set is equal to 0 or 1 you you increase your training set size okay on x axis and if you increase your training set size what is rmsc value okay you plot rmsc value with training set size okay so your curve training uh, set curve is something like this as you can see in this particular diagram plot right and similarly you also find testing set accuracy or rmsc in blue line okay so uh, here in this particular diagram you'll be able to find that uh, uh, this is uh, example of uh, you can say that uh, overfitting right this is example of uh, overfitting means what uh, it is actually uh, as you can see uh, the value of rmsc is on okay for this particular case it is on lower side and for uh, this particular training uh, set it is on higher side so if if you find both of these uh, curves are approaching towards uh, right they are very much closer to each other and ultimately uh, the value of this error is on higher side okay this is the way to decide yes it is a case of underfitting or overfitting right so this is the way uh, first way out the second curve let me explain okay uh, here you can find that uh, okay uh, sorry the previous one is example of uh, underfitting but here as you can see uh, the model is performing better the model is performing better for training set and uh, it is also performing okay with testing set but the gap between these two things is bit larger okay uh, so you can say that it is overfitting curve okay so it again depends that at what level it reaches right so for this particular example uh, one uh, rmsc is also higher so that is why we can say that it is overfitting right so once you find that it is overfitting if if it is underfitted uh, you can say that uh, thing what you can uh, do you know you can get your features right that is the only way out means what if your uh, feature data points are having errors then it may get uh, into underfitting but in case of overfitting there are two ways out uh, agar overfit aapka uh, model ho raha hai you can get more data okay more and more data but most of the time uh, to get more and more data it is not possible so what we do we go with regularization techniques okay so uh, in in linear regression uh, we have some regularization techniques uh, like ridge regression lasso regression and elastic net regression okay with the help of uh, this three methods basic method you will be able to constrain your model parameters value right or constrain model parameters weight so uh, with the help of this regression method you uh, sorry uh, regularization uh, regression method you will be able to constrain model parameter values so constraint that means what uh, model parameters some of the model parameters uh, for example if they are getting very higher values of uh, theta so with the help of uh, regularization techniques the constraint will be given on those uh, model parameters and ultimately you will be able to find uh, uh, near optimum model parameters value which is not giving you overfitting okay so uh, in, i will share this particular notebook with you guys okay and you will be able to understand so this is the only part that is left okay implementation detail and uh, uh, you can even implement ridge regression and lasso regression similarly so uh, this is the only uh, line of code you should understand okay so yeah so in in case of previous case the uh, uh, the way we calculate gradient you know you remember the way we calculate gradient is for linear regression is was this right it is like 2 upon m as you can see multiplied by x transpose so this is x transpose and again uh, we multiply this with uh, you can say that x theta so this is dot product between x and theta okay minus y so this is the value of you can say that regression gradient 
normal regression gradient but in case of uh, elastic net we add some more term and that more term is r into theta okay plus 1 minus r into 2 into alpha into theta and here alpha is actually actually regularization term right alpha is regularization term here r into sorry r into alpha okay so this term actually constrains your weight so we add this term into gradient actually and i have derived this particular part uh, for lasso and for ridge regression here so uh, this is for this particular equation is for elastic net you can replace this equation with this and it will become ridge regularization method you can replace this particular equation with this and it will become lasso reg regularization method okay so how we derive this okay uh, so that is also uh, the equation uh, for this particular okay ridge regression let me take you to that particular slide so you will surely understand and i will then conclude this session so this is an equation for ridge regression as you can see okay as you can see this is an equation of ridge regression regularization equation okay please wait yeah so uh, what is the cost function value of cost function this is cost function it is msc plus this term and if you partially okay j theta partial derivation with theta j if you if you find you have to find partial derivative of msc theta we know the uh, value of uh, partial derivation of msc theta and if you derive this okay so this will become if you if you simply uh, 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 find partial derivative of this it will become like uh, squared this is a square term so 2 into alpha into theta so that will become derivation of ridge regression okay uh, partial derivation of ridge regression similarly what is partial derivation of elastic net uh, elastic net's equation is something like this so if you want to find partial derivative of this particular term so what is that it is something that i explained in this particular okay uh, google colab so this is um, uh, this is lasso term we call it and this is ridge term okay so ridge regression uh, term and lasso regression term we call it l1 and this is l2 if you add these two terms it will become elastic net so 50% weightage r is uh, value of r if value of r is 0.5 so 50% weightage is given to lasso term and 50% weightage to elastic net term okay and it will become uh, sorry uh, ridge term so ultimately it will become a elastic net okay so if you if you find partial derivative of this term and partial derivative of this term it becomes this particular equation okay so let me come back to that particular okay here so this become this particular term this equation of python okay code so i hope this is clear uh, i will share this notebook uh, through your uh, uh, workshop coordinator so you can uh, okay simply run this particular notebook through google colab and you'll be able to understand the concept so uh, this is from my side that's it sir over to you sir and thank you very much for attending this session if you have any question please ask if there is any question so because of the limitation of time uh, right uh, the part that actually the regularization part i want to explain the coding part but i think uh, the code is self explanatory you will be able to understand this code okay uh, by running this uh, notebook right so you you can go through each and every step and ultimately you'll be able to understand the concept uh, behind this uh, basic yet effective uh, regularization technique in linear regression right yeah so please ask question if you are having any you can ask this question uh, through chat box yes please if there is any question kindly put forward quickly
Uh, thank you very much, uh, respected faculty members, for your feedback. Uh, doctor, the next question is there in the chat box. Yes. Yes. Uh, sir, your voice is not properly audible. Sir, sir yeah. you can see the uh, queries of the candidate on chat yeah. box. Yes, yes, it is there. It's so there. let me answer that question. Uh, yes. Based on the value of theta, what we can do, we can print values of uh, all these theta. And obviously, if the value of theta is zero, right? So the weight uh, that models want to assign to that particular feature, if it is zero, that means what? It is not that important. So the value of theta may decide uh, that which features are more important uh, on which feature we, we want to give more weight and which feature is having lesser weight in the decision making. So yes, obviously, sir, uh, believe sir, uh, sorry, Silpi uh, Bismam, you are right. So yes, it can help you decide feature selection too. But for feature selection, there are many uh, important techniques like uh, uh, PCA, uh, like methods, principal component analysis. You can also you can also take help of covariance matrix and everything. So that uh, this tools also helps you find uh, uh, feature selection. Yeah. Any other question? Yes, sir. I I think there is no queries on the side of participant. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. You have presented all the things related to this algorithm. Yes. So, Thank you very much and uh, really wonderful session. So thanks once again, thanks to you and thanks to Professor Cecil sir. So thank you once again. So now in the fourth day, fourth day we are closing this session and tomorrow uh, on the fifth day, we will start the session SARP at nine o'clock. Thank you once again, thank all you, participant and our respected experts. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you, thank sir, you. and thank you, respected Cecil, sir, for providing me this opportunity. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank thanks you, to all the participants. Dr. Nilesh Patel uh, had uh, attended this session very actively. I was just a listener, but it's a wonderful session. I'm sure all the participants must be benefited with them. But yes, my advice really, to... really wonderful, sir. Yes. Really wonderful. <laughs> Yes, yes. And my you advice have to given part... lots of information, lots of <laughs> yes, yes. In fact, uh, my feedback is that it's very good in implementation of all kind of AI and machine learning algorithm. Uh -huh. So participants may remain in contact with him, and in case of any uh, input required, even in future, he yes, will be yes, very sir. helpful in all system. Sir, yes. I, I, yes. I know that your you and your team is really. <laughs> uh, doing wonderful and uh, very hard working research team sir no, no, i'm i'm blessed with my colleagues and uh, <laughs> friends uh, i feel very blessed thanks thank dr you. asutosh and uh, thank we'll you. discuss okay. here okay. thank you sir thank you very much thank you, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nilesh, are you there? Dr. Nilesh, are you there?
Yes, uh, I'd requested Dr. Nilesh to provide his contact details. Uh, somehow he has left, but he is joining uh, just now and he will mention his mail ID and other details for your support. Yes, please wait for some moment. Dr. Nilesh Patel will provide his contact details. Yes, uh, I hope uh, now your queries are well served. Dr. Nilesh Patil has provided his contact number as well as mail ID also. In case of any requirement, uh, preferably you can drop a mail to him. And uh, video of this uh, session are all other sessions as mentioned by participants. I am expecting that it will be provided by organizational team led by Dr. Ashutosh Bhatt. And I will pass this message to him and he will share with you. Thanks a lot. Bye for now. See you tomorrow.